would find if you read a car magazine, it's it's probably like that the car's going to be nicely cleaned rather than covered in dirt and filthy. So uh, there's an absolute plethora of, 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 of websites and articles out there that show you how you can paint your figures and how you can paint your figures and enjoy painting them at the same time. Weirdly, that's not my part of the hobby. I'm not a big fan of, of painting figures. I, I like playing games. So that's a, that's back to the point of it's my that's my hobby, not so much the hobby. So I'd like to think there's a wealth of material out there that right from the the basics to right through to the advanced. There's no end of books, magazines, and articles online that will show you how to paint your figures. And it's a challenge and it's daunting. If you're starting out as your first figure in your hand and you're looking at a figure in War Games Illustrated, you might be going, it's never going to look like that. And frankly, it's not until you spend several years honing your skills and getting better at painting. So we're, we're setting a, we are setting a certain standard not that you've got to achieve that standard but we like to think that we're showing people what they can achieve and you know people are painting figures like that so why shouldn't you hey everyone welcome to the weekender yes another week has passed and now it's time for a weekend of Chip chat all about what's been going on in the world of tabletop gaming. Yep. But first, we should remind people about some awesome prizes that they could win. Yeah, so this week on the website, guys, we had our fantastic Team Yankee week for the new Leopardburg. The West Germans have landed and they are looking absolutely fantastic. But we had two prizes up for grabs during the week, which are two two player starter bundles that you could win. So, what you could win in the bundle is the Russian starter set, the German starter set, the Team Yankee core rulebook, and the Leopard book. So this is a really great week, guys. Anything and everything you could ever want to know about the West Germans and Team Yankee, this is where you need to check. Plain, simple, and absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. The, the week is chock-a-block. Yes. There's probably a few items on there that aren't yet out yet, yep. or not on there. Uh, remember to comment on uh, Beast of War, yep. the YouTube channel, yep. and the Facebook page. Yep to maximize your chance of winning those awesome bundles. Mm -hmm. Now, there is going to be another week of comments that people can actually get in. So, we're not announcing the winners this week, we're announcing them on next week's show, okay? So you have one more week to get your comments in to try and win one of those two epic prizes. So what are you waiting for? Get on with it, people! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, before we get stuck into news and stuff today, we also have the Hobby Lab challenge that's running at the minute. Yes. With all the scatter terrain and stuff like that. So I had a quick look through some of the entries. There's loads of entries that started popping yeah, yeah. up. But I had a quick look through for some of them to show off. I don't want to show all of them in one show. You know, we might just do a few this week, a few next week. Aye. See how it goes. So th this is what has caught your knife, your eye for the initial set of these, yeah? So who do we have first, Lloyd? Yes, we have Geist, G-A-I-S-T, I believe that's pronounced Geist. That's the one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's been working on some cool stuff, if we can bring it up. Uh, yeah, so I think I have it here. So what has he been making here? He is, he, well, he's making some awesome terrain at the minute. Oh, wow. But, he, but he's carving it all out of... Um, uh, urethane. Urethane, yeah. Yeah. Wow. But he, your, your question to me yeah. is if you're going to do this sort of stuff, you're like, why don't you use like... Um, well, you see, this, this is the thing. I'm looking at this. Coffee I'm looking at the, the finished product. And it, yeah. It's looking like a really, really cool, nice little wooden shack sort of a thing that he's coming up with at the end here. If I scroll yeah. on down. But here we go, right? This all is right. why he's not using... He's not using wood, wooden stirrers and things like that, okay. Justin, because he has devised the ultimate method of making this fast. Well, okay. <laughs> faster than it would be normally. All right. Check out what he's been up to. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing a, a standard, you know, little Stanley knife. Yeah. He's broke it apart and, ah, yes. I see what he's doing. He's made himself a carving thingy-majig. That's really <laughs> clever. Which means... He's made himself a little jig. He can just put it down on the polystyrene or urethane or whatever the heck you want to call it. And drag it along, yeah. And hey yeah. presto, he's got loads of planks. That is super clever. But, but, the, but the main reason I, want to look, I wanted to highlight it is just to, to look at what do you see now what Justin's scrolling to. Yeah. It looks amazing, his carving, what he's doing here. Mm. He's, he's working away on this terrain and he's, he's been carving this, this chimney stack. Uh, he's, uh, he's done a full-on chimney. And the results are just 
The wait, this picture. Oh here. my god! Look at that carving detail. That is incredible. I have never seen anyone be able to sculpt rotten brick just like that. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. The thing, I, the thing I wanted to know is uh, how durable this material is. So it might be something they want to ask about on the the topic and find out like whether or not you can take a bit of a bashing and stuff like that because it looks quite. Uh, Quite easy to, to knock and stuff. But, uh, That's the downside to this. It is really easy to knock. Like, we could be yeah. playing this, Aye. and you could be reaching over for a mini or something and just knock that chimney and, and break it in two. I don't just know. Just knock cause... the top right off. No, I've built stuff out of, of polystyrene Have sheets you ever and give stuff. it a good matte varnish, or would that react uh, with the, the polyurethane? Well, we'll see. We'll throw it out there. I've never managed to firm it up to a, a stage where, it, you know, a good whack won't break it. Aye. Mm. So, but man, it, even if it does, will it, will it shatter, or will it... Just no, it'll just, clean break, break. it'll just break off and then you glue it back on, but... So it's, it's repairable. It's never quite the same, because you'll have that brake seam and stuff that you're trying to work on. I don't know. So, don't know. It's, what, got, it's got some real What you're doing there looks amazing. Yes. yes. Me, personally, I'm trying to move away from the, from the whole polystyrene blocks thing, mm. just because the, I don't find it that durable. So you know, because we have we, we carve well, I've carved amazing looking tables and stuff out of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And people will be playing on it, and I'll just hear a clink. A right. crunch noise, and I, <laughs> there goes the corner or something. Right. And then about an hour later, another crunchy noise. There goes the corner or something else. Well, you re you remember sort of the the red desert tables you guys made years and years ago? We still have them, but they have needed a bit of love and attention over the years just to keep them looking half decent. Yeah, like just last week, I kicked the corner off one of them. Really? Yeah, I was just walking past it. <laughs> you kicked didn't, it. Hang on, you didn't tell anyone <laughs> in the office that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm still gonna blame it on John. Oh, lovely. Yep. Next up, we have. Oh goodness, how do you say this? It Icarus, it it Christopher I, I, I Christopher let's, let's I Christopher two. I R Christopher two. Yeah, you got there in the end. <laughs> Is it not Sir Christopher two? I think you've missed a letter in. Oh, your I've show missed, it's Sir Christopher two. I've missed a a, a, a note a letter <laughs> when I was copying it. But yes, he, the, this guy proves why bottle caps are amazing and worth keeping. Okay, he's making some nice little objective markers out of these. I quite like this. I keep scrolling down because you're looking at the minute going, yeah, it's bottle caps. Oh, hang on. He's, he's cut the top off the bottles. Yeah. And not just the cap. But all you have to do is give them a good paint and immediately... They look fantastic. Yeah. They start to... Yeah. Look at that. Immediate yeah. sci-fi barrels. Yeah, those are... I am amazed. I've been preaching, preaching in the office here. Yeah. To keep the bottle caps. Yeah, and I've been throwing out bottles left, right, and centre just to spite them. <laughs> because bottle caps are amazing for this sort of stuff. I want to come up with all sorts of ways of using bottle caps. Right. So much so that I have loads oh. of oh. bottle caps. <laughs> That's how many bottle caps I have saved up in here. I wonder who's going to have to clean that. Do you want a close up? Ugh. Hey! Do you want a close up? Ugh. I'm not very good at this. Hey! What the heck? Okay, well, don't throw stuff at the cameras anymore, please. But bottle caps, <laughs> bottle caps are great, right? Yeah. Because when you see this, right? Quick idea for you. Stick them together like that. All right. And you've got a, like a, a front wheel. Yeah. Stick another one together. You've got your back wheel. Mm. Oh, I can't, I'm, I'm making them hash. Oh, goodness sakes, I can't get it right. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> Stick them together. You see, the problem I'm having is you kind of need to find ones that match, otherwise they look a little weird. Ta-da! I can't do this on camera at all. Ta-da! Ah, well. Sort it. Another, There's, there are bottle caps use. all across our table now. Making... Ma <laughs> making wheels and stuff. Yeah. Because I'm looking at it and thinking, do you know the Batman tumbler type bike thing? Aye. Oh, don't tell me you're going to try and scratch build one of them. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm just throwing it out there as an idea. That'd be <laughs> awesome. I'd love to see that using bottle caps as the, as the actual wheels. Because yeah. I mean, it'd see, be great for works or something. Uh, well, you see, if you were doing some orc wreckage or something for your scatter terrain, you could do up these, have them as the tires, and just have you know bits of them lying here and well, big big tire stacks and stuff done in barricades and things could be very cool. Maybe they don't actually look like tires though. If you paint them up, they, they still you would still have to adjust them as sort of well. Maybe they do look a bit like tread. Hey, well, go back like, to the picture. If, if you go to this this one here. This one to me, if you put it on its side and actually just have it wedged in between stuff, so don't show the two blank ends, but yeah. just have that, that ridged edge showing along it, that would just look like a, a tire has been stuffed into a wall. Yeah, I guess that's right, yeah. It'd be great for like 28 mil sort of scaled, heroic scaled yeah. um, buggies for, you know, post-apocalyptic games and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So keep your bottle caps, people. Just keep them. You will keep... find uses for them. I'm telling you, you will. So Lloyd's, Lloyd, <laughs> Lloyd's advice today, don't recycle. Keep it at home and use it. <laughs> Just keep it. Right. You're recycling game, you're your game own. recycling, that's what you're doing. Next up, the last one I want to have a wee look at. Uh-huh. So who do we have this time? 
Oh, God, you're going to put me on the spot again. Elif? Elif, yes. Let's go with that. Ooh. Elif's working <laughs> away on stuff out of cogwheels and stuff, but yeah. it's this. See this ten b base 10 blocks that yeah. caught my eye? And I thought, ooh, I have to bring this up. Scroll on down and see what he's doing with these. All right. Look at the awesome base that it makes for his terrain. Yeah, not plinth-like at all. That's not plinth-like. That's like that's street -like. what I said. I said that's not plinth-like at all. Are you are you sounded sure? very ironic. Uh, it did sound <laughs> ironic, didn't it? Yeah. But I love that. Sarcastic, ah! sorry. <laughs> I like this. He's got some cool-looking bike-type things there as well. Oh, you see, that's that's the bogies off of a, uh, a World War Two Sherman. Oh, is it? So he's I, he's using some other stuff to build on these bases as actually like a nice little industrial area. Yeah. I really like this idea. Well, uh, you see, he's took two little battery-operated motors here, a couple of cogs on them, yeah. and now that's like a big dynamo or generator that you can lay down on his table, as well as some nice I beams being stacked. Yeah, where in the have background. you been getting your I beams from? Because I, I, I did Google your base ten blocks, so uh, there should be a, a link or something uh, for them. There you go. So if you want to go shopping, you yeah. get them in all sorts of well, varieties. They're, they're actually reasonably inexpensive as well. Um, yeah, ish. They're seven pound for a pack. I can live with that. I can get definitely quite a few bases that. out of that. Yeah. If you're, well, I don't know. If you're trying to do vast amounts, it's kind of expensive. But if you're trying to do a few key signature pieces like yeah. that, bit of terrain that he's showing off. Yeah. Very cool. It, it paints up really well. Mm. Anyway, keep your entries coming in. We're loving the look of them. Yep. Um, Can't wait to see more of it. Don't forget, the competition runs until the 31st of next month. So you do have time to maybe create that, that big, massive, epic project for Scatter Terrain that you've been looking for, which could be very, very cool because uh, we do have the, the four categories for it. So we have one for our junior beast, that's every beast who's 16 years or under. We have our best concept, our best tutorial, and I believe it's our best overall executed one. So that's going to be four possible ways for you to win. Make sure and get your comments in, or not your comments, your posts in, in the hobby forums on beastofwar.com for your chance to be winning something here. Absolutely. Just stick something on the front of them. What is it? The Hobby Lab entry or something? What is uh, it? Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it up in an overlay here. It's the, the Hobby Lab Open Challenge, I yeah. believe, is the, the first thing you're meant to say. I'm well, we'll have a link to the forum and stuff in the posts. Yeah, exactly. We will. Exactly. Ben, I was yes. going to go for a break, but I think, I think I'm just going to come straight to you because you want to talk about Age of Sigmar. Yes, of course. I, hey. Yes, I want to talk about some more, yes. Because it yes. came up in the news this week for new box sets, I believe. Yes, so uh, Age of Sigma have got some really fantastic stuff uh, that sort of leaked out there, and it's coming out this weekend, so it should be available right now. And this is uh, some new start collecting sets uh, that they're bringing out for Age of Sigma, yeah. So uh, we've got, um, I think it's one, two, three, four, we've got about five new boxes, I think it is. Well, well did you say stamp collecting sets? Start collecting. Well, oh, they, but they start could have collecting. stamp collecting sets. Ta da! Well, but, uh... <laughs> okay, so the first thing we're seeing here is the Flesh Eater Quartz, or Quartz. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so is this Flesh vampire count? Pardon, sorry. Yes, they're the they're what the, the vampire counts have turned into. So they're now the uh, sort of grand alliance of death, mm. and the flesh eater court are very much based around the ghouls and stuff like that. So you're going to be seeing a lot of those guys in here. So. I am quite liking the starter set, especially with that big sort of necrotic dragon in the background. It's really really nice. Yeah, what that's the their big uh, zombie dragon. Yeah. All right. What's our next one here? Cool. So the next one that we're looking at is for the Iron Jaw. So this is the reimagining, effectively, the Orcs. Mm. So here we've got, well, they're now called Orcs. Um, but so, yeah, we've got the really cool infantry there that are based off the Black Orcs from the Warhammer Fantasy world. We've got the Gore Grunters on the back uh, there, so the guys on the big beasts mm. riding into battle. And at the front, you've got a War Chanter there who's going to have the two big beat sticks together that he drums out his uh, tunes on. And actually, <laughs> in the fluff, he actually drums this out on the bodies of the enemies that he's killed. So that's pretty cool. Sweet. So. Interesting. All I'm going to say is finally, finally, because when we've been looking at this recently, I, yeah. I think it was the Oryx I started to lean towards thinking, oh, actually, that'd be really cool. And then Ben went, there is no starter set for them. I'm like, why, GWY? Uh, <laughs> sorted. Yeah. As if by magic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our next one is the Corn Bloodbind. So I assume this is now from the, the two player starter set coming into a one player starter set, Ben. Yeah, so this is actually um, sort of expanding things up from what you would have got in the two-player start set. So you've got all the, the, the blood warriors there with their heavy armor and their twin axes and things like that. At the front, you've got the Slaughter Priest, who's possibly one of the coolest and most metal models they've done so far. Mm. I think he'd belong on the front, front of like a metal album or something. And at the back as well, you've got the Juggernauts that uh, everybody knows and loves uh, from the olden days as well. So you've got a very heavily armored shock troop-like uh, army here with the, for mm. these guys, yeah. It's cool. great that none of the, none of the models are, are, are new, but it is great to just put them all in a package and, and just have that moment of walking into a games workshop store and just going, Army, please. I'd I like, will I'd have like that. to explore this. 
I yeah, will I have mean, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, all of these retail at 50 quid, so, you know, not too bad. You're getting some free stuff in there as well, effectively, so it's pretty good for, yeah. for the price they set at. Yeah. I'm liking the look of the Stormcast Eternal one. Yeah, so this uh, comes with the, the Lord Celestant at the front there, which is very, very cool. He has the cloak that can actually send hammers flying out of it and things like that, which is very awesome. <laughs> and behind them, you've got the two retributors with the big hammers. It's a shame there's only two of them. Would have been nice to see three because that's the sort of standard unit size. Mm. Uh, then you've got the five liberators and then the three prosecutors at the back as well with their hammers to fling at the enemies and stuff. Yeah. But importantly, with these... Um, especially as you can see within the prosecutor set, they've actually given you the options to sort of give them different weapons and such. Mm. So you will be able to bring in some of the more specialized stuff as well. That's pretty great. Sweet. Great. Nice. I do like the design of these. If Warren hadn't already taken the Stormcast, this would have been my faction. Unfortunately, <laughs> he got the first pick, so now I'm on to choice two, which is, of course, the Chaos. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still humming in hand. I do like the Oryx, though. Mm. Well, I, I think you like these guys as well, the Soldaneth. Ah, the Groot Army. Groot. They've now got their starter set as well. What's in this, Ben? Yeah, so at the front of here, you've got the Branch Wraith, who's uh, their spellcaster, and got a little tiny grub as well on her that attacks you when it gets into close combat. You have then got a plethora of different uh, dryads for you to pick up and use and stuff as well. So this is one of the existing plastic kits from the old range that's been sort of brought up to date. And at the very back as well, in this set, you get a Tree Man, which is insane. So you're going to get yourself a Tree Man Ancient to, uh, you can make up in different ways to cast your spells or just get I've, stomping into combat and crushing things. I do think they look amazing, mm-hmm. but I do think they'd be a pain in the behind. They what? look like they have all these little branches and stuff that would just constantly be breaking off. Surely it's <laughs> going to be in hard plastic if you're careful with it. You shouldn't yeah. be too bad. I mean, like, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen some plastics that actually can take a fair bit of a beating before they'll actually snap. But even when you go to do something like careful with them, like stick them into your foam tray, you can maybe push on the wrong bit and snap it. Maybe, and the other thing is you're done to do your line of sight and you stab yourself in the eye. <laughs> uh, okay, that might, an branch. Issue. that might be an issue. You yeah. know what, you need to get and, the, and then uh, you're the standing there going, phone. damn you, Groot. I, I, I have had times while building spiky miniatures where the miniature has stabbed me instead of my craft knife. Someone, <laughs> someone built a flipping space marine here. I stabbed myself on it during the week. Oh, there, yeah, yeah. there was a regular space marine sitting Ben, right? Yeah. And I reached over to grab it, only to find out someone had stuck a metal spear on the flipping thing, and I'd stabbed yeah. myself in the hand. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was, it like was a... straight. It was straight to the toolbox. Get the clippers and go. That's the end of that. Whoever created a stupid spiky flipping marine. I, well, it. <laughs> It was one of us in here that I'm guessing built it, and I'm willing to lay odds I know who it is. I won't name names on camera, but what they've used is actually a metal spear, which we had laying around, which yeah. actually was hammered and flattened at the end and done with a really, really sharp point. Yeah, literally, it's a set of spears that came in from somewhere, and they were like proper brass-rodded spears, and they were really jabby. Aye. And someone thought, this is a great idea, I'll stick this on the back of a space marine, so this boy can come along one day, one merry day, and go, into his hand. <laughs> You always stab yourself in the hand, though. Tears for that. You always stab yourself in the hand. <laughs> I've seen you make tables and stab a knife into your hand. Oh, dear. Well, you know, stabby McStabby. <laughs> uh, stabby McStabface. Is, is that everything for the GW stuff? Uh, they've actually, um, actually released some uh, sculpted bases as well, which is very, very cool. Um, so they've, gone them, they've done them for all the different sizes. Uh, so you've got 25 mil and 30, uh, 32 mil for your basic infantry. Mm. Uh, and as it goes up, you've got ones for monsters and the uh, mounted units as well. Um, for the actual larger uh, creatures that you might be bringing, so dragons and stuff like that, instead of doing sculpted bases, they're actually doing um, base kits effectively. So you just drop down bits of rubble and ruins and things onto yeah. them. And uh, yeah, it's looking very cool. I wish this stuff had come out a little earlier so that when I was putting together my uh, Silver Tower collection, I could have used sculpted bases rather than having to use uh, texture paints and stuff like that. But uh, there you go. Maybe the next set. <laughs> Damn you, GW, for not having me sooner. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, no actually, pleasing some people, Ben. I've actually had an idea for how to base my chaos now. Yeah. I'm going to do the entire base with a black ash earth, and then I'm going to see if I can get some finely done orange like flock and just sprinkle that over the top a little bit to make it look as if there's fire in beneath the ground, which I think might look very cool. You're really going for this black base thing. Every, every base for every army should be black. No. <laughs> At least you're going to put details well, into this well, one. Did you see my Signor a few <laughs> weeks back? They were on beautifully MDF done sculpted they bases. They were. They were sweet, I have to admit it. They were sweet, but I think you missed a <laughs> trick with those. Really? On your bases, you still drew on the lines to represent the front arc, right? Yeah, whereas, but I tried whereas, to be... whereas most of the bases have a straight edge mm. in it, 
I was thinking, you know what, if you'd made the straight edge represent your front and back art, you wouldn't Maybe. have had to have any lines. Maybe, but I mean, like, I did it differently this time, because the last time I tried to show arcs on a miniature, I painted the entire front and the entire back. This time it's just two nice, discreet little blue lines at the side, which I think it's, it's a little more discreet and a little, little prettier, which I think works a little better. Just saying, I think you missed a trick. Well, Something maybe. to investigate the next time if you're going to use that Stella base again. Yeah, well, I will be expanding the forces, so we'll see what happens. Okay, up next, we're done with the GW now. Yeah, we are, yeah. Up yep. next, Ben, we have... We have the uh, Malifaux crews that are going to be at Gen Con this year. So this is seven new crews to match all the different uh, uh, crew masters that are coming out as well. So we've got them for all the different factions here. So there's very, very nice things to check out for this one. Yeah. So uh, we, we kick things off, uh, actually, with The Pen is Mightier, which is very cool. So it's a whole bunch of sort of press, press ladies getting out there and spreading the news and stuff like that. So I imagine they're going to be fiddling with scheme markers and things so that they don't count as things and stuff like that, which is very, very cool. The printing press is creepy. It is very, very creepy. Yeah, <laughs> it makes you think bad things about newspapers. It but, took me uh, ages to look at it and go, what the heck is that? Uh, oh, and the, 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 the labels. And the name's right beneath <laughs> The name's right beneath it. <laughs> but I was looking at it going, it looks like some sort of weird... It's a little mechanical no, spider -y thing. It looked to me, at first glance, like some sort of weird old car on legs. Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I can see how you would think I that. thought this crew was going to go driving around or walking around in this weird, creepy car thing. No. <laughs> All right, who's our next one, Ben? So the next one we've got up is an Oni's Wrath, which is their Far Eastern-inspired guys. And so we've got some very cool demons here and things like that. And the strange mistress as well, so a Kumi there. Asami, sorry, there, who's sort of like summoning things around her and things. Mm. Very, very cool indeed. Really creepy stuff. I like the yokai in this. They're very, yes. very nice. They are very cool, yeah. yeah. Next up. Uh, so next up, we've got the Mercy of Death, which is very cool as well. Uh, some fantastic things in here. I love the mounted model. We don't see enough of those in Malifaux, so it'd be good to see some more stuff of that. It'd be interesting to see how some of these go together, sort of plastic kit-wise, because I know that Malifaux can sometimes be the, the devil to put together, but uh, should be okay with some of these, I imagine. Mm. Uh, I like them. What do you think, Lloyd? Yeah, it's looking cool. Uh, I'm looking at the mounted thing as well, going, that's pretty cool. It, it might be the angle it's at. It's very, very tall looking horse, this. Yeah. yeah. Go back to that. But I think it's the actual posing of the horse as well, because the, yeah. the head is sort of drawn back and up. Because as, as my eye followed it up, I thought she was sitting on a camel to begin with. <laughs> for some reason. Really? Yeah. I, I, the, one, the one thing I did like about this as well is the fact that all of their sort of Trooper guys, I think they're called the Shield Bearers. There have got those big swords that effectively remind me a little bit of Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, right. which is very nice. So it's sort of over exaggeration, which is very cool. Nice. Uh, oh, hello. This is me right here. Yeah, these fistful are the very, very cool cowboy looking guys, these guys. Yeah. So we've got the, the, a fistful of Scrip, is their name, these guys. Yeah. I am very, totally very cool. sold on this faction. The it Bandidos are sweet. fantastic. Parker Barrows just looks like a badass. You've got Doc Mitchell in there, and Mad Doc Brackett looks really, <laughs> really cool. I am. This is my faction right here. This is my faction. You think that's it? Yeah, yeah. This, 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 this is. They're this, doing well because now you're looking at that going, that's your faction. Last week I was looking at a faction going, that's my faction. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I noticed isn't here. Uh, well, we still have a way to go yet. Let's see. We have the Queen's Return. Who are these guys, Ben? Yeah, so these are a very, very creepy and strange bunch, this one. Uh, I, I think they're actually very much tied into the the, uh, the lore of what's going on within Ripples of Fate, because uh, the character that you see here on the front, uh, Titania, is actually one of, the character, one of the characters on the front of the cover of the book. So I wouldn't be surprised if we hear a lot more about her when the story comes out for this. But there's uh, some very, very interesting models in this set. I mean, Titania herself is very, very cool. But I really like the Aislin, I think it's called there, which mm. is effectively something that looks like it's got roots and strange things all around it. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. Roma so, says very, this very is cool. one of his favourite sec er, yeah. sections. Sets as well. Sets, Sets. that's it. <laughs> words, Lloyd, words. And then we have uh, the Sky Pirates. Is it oh, hello. <laughs> yeah, so this is them adding some more stuff to the Gremlins with their weird and wacky machines. So it basically seems like they've raided the, the stores of the Arcanists or something like that, or maybe yeah. the Guild, and run off with a whole bunch of technology. So we've got some really, really fun models in here, like You've got Zippo and all these types the of things. I mean, do look amazing. These they are do look really, very, very cool. really cool. But, but I'm again looking at them going, mm, some really spiky bits on that. It'd be, it'd be difficult to move them around and keep them intact. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And then we have, I believe, our last faction, Beacon of Knowledge. Yeah, so this is my favourite, mainly because I just love the idea of using that Jin, that sort of genie character there, 
I'm working up a way to paint him with some light blues and stuff, and mm. almost trying to make him look like he's made of smoke. I think would be very, very fantastic. But I just love the uh, the 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 master for this box as well. He's very, very cool. This is another one of Ramar's favourites from the set. You two uh, that he's eyeing up. He must be sitting in, in Paris, going, oh. oh, he's just sitting there rubbing his hands, going. Some lovely painting soon. evenings coming up, people. Some yeah, yeah, lovely yeah. painting evenings. Yeah, these are absolutely fantastic, and that's a lot. Yeah, so just, just to, just to let like. you know, Lloyd, unfortunately, the one that you, you were looking at last uh, last week, which is the wild ones, they're the exclusive one that's going to be there at Gen Con. So unfortunately, no. you might not be able to get it straight away, but maybe later on down the line, you will be able to. We'll see. Oh, my goodness. Typical. The one I like is the Gen Con sort of preview exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, Lloyd, th oh, this well. is for you. This is the world's saddest song on the world's smallest violin. Can you hear it? <laughs> Sorry, that was harsh. <laughs> It's supposed to be like that, is it not? No, it's that. Are you sure it's not like that? No. Oh, if it's like that, you're asking me for money. I don't know, you must make money. I'm not asking you for Oh, it does look a bit like... Shut up. Well, let's move on. Moving on. Yeah. Ben, there's some... yeah. we're going to look at some news that isn't actually on the website yet. Yeah, so this is news that's going to be coming out on uh, on Monday, but we thought we'd share it with you guys now so you can get some comments in and stuff like that. And this is that uh, Robot Wars, the very, very cool show from the 90s and early 2000s, is going to be back on TV on Sunday, which is very, very, very cool. Yes! Woo! Right, for those those out there who don't know what Robot Wars is, what is it, Ben? Okay, so Robot Wars was effectively uh, uh, a whole bunch of different teams who would come up and make robots to get smashed up and attack each other in arena. And there were all different types of things they did. So there was ones where you know there were places they need to get to, or sometimes they just need to smash each other up or go to different points and things like that. But one of the other really cool things about it was that they had these these uh, robots called the house robots, and they were in the corners and they would attack you and stuff if you got too close. But it was basically just a huge robot death match. And it was very, 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 very good fun. The very, thing, very the thing about the house robots that we've just seen, mm. bring, bring it yeah. back up there oh, with yeah. with Ben. Okay. Uh, oh, can okay. you bring it back? Yeah, we yeah. have the likes of Dead Metal, Matilda, Shunt, and Sir Kill a lot. Yeah, mm. they were the robots I wanted to see. <laughs> Unfortunately, everybody, pretty much everybody who turned up to enter the show had this little flat robot with a flipper. <laughs> I mean, you see, right? You think you think Robot Wars? You think Sledgehammer, uh, Circular Saw? Yeah some sort of spiky gun spitting no. thing or something, right? Everybody who did well turned up with a wedge that had a flipper. It just ground down into most boring robots turning up. See, this is why I prefer to Whereas watch the Whereas the house America. robots, yeah, yeah, the house cool. robots were awesome looking. Yeah, this is Especially why... Sir Killalot, let me bring him up again. Was he your favourite? <laughs> yeah, because he's big and massive. Now, I've watched, they have like this little preview trailer thing on BBC mm -hmm. iPlayer for this. Yeah. yeah, where they're showing you the house robots. They're bigger, they're badder, they're faster. And they are like two or three times heavier than they used to be, two or three times faster than they used to be. Yeah, yeah. They'll still probably drive around at like three miles an hour. Oh, you see, the, <laughs> the funny thing is, I actually got to meet the driver of Sir Killalot yeah. uh, back in 2000 whenever I went across to the Techno Games with my school. You what? You yeah, were there? Yeah, cool. I, got, I got to film in their studio uh, doing the Techno Games. It was sort of like a, a robot Olympics thing. The, the school decided <laughs> to take us across for it. Absolutely hilarious. Fantastic trip. We had a blast. We entered three of the contests, right? One for the running, one for the swimming, and one for the uh, gymnastics. Did they download your psyche into the robots? No, but here's what happened. <laughs> the one we had in the running race, we managed to blow up in the pits. The right. one that we had for the swimming blew up on the track. <laughs> and the one that we had for the gymnastics, I unfortunately strangled on camera. Oh, well, there you go. What? Uh, just in case you don't believe it. I don't believe it. That this... Here's me. Oh my goodness. Here is a, a very younger, very skinny, fully head, head of haired me at the Techno <laughs> Games 2000. Who is that little happy chappy? Yeah, oh, the funny God. thing is, I'm actually carrying th that box there, was actually a remote control trolled Matilda that I bought at the event. Huh, oh, please tell me you still have it. No, it got lost in a move. Oh. You know, the, the little flywheel at the back and everything worked on it, it was amazing. The dreaded move losing stuff. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but. No, it, it was actually funny that trip as well, because I actually went across, had a great time, came back with a kidney infection. <laughs> as you do, as you yeah, do. do. Go yes, to see robots kill spent, each other. Spent the drive from the south of England up to Scotland, lying across three seats in the minibus, just dying the whole way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> of course, Poor that's not the worst us. of it. One of the other kids that was with us actually lost his little toe. To a robot? Please tell me it was to a robot. No, he was messing about in the hotel room, knocked down a mirror, and it sliced his toe off. <laughs> 
worse than it was, the teachers were actually away having a drink with the ones that were taking care of us. <laughs> Did they find it? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, they got it reattached. It was fine. <laughs> but it was just hilarious. Because that was, the night that happened, that happened to him, and I came down sick. So they come back after having a couple of drinks to take him to casualty yeah. and to find me with my head stuffed down the bog. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for his toe. No, no, puking, 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 all the way. <laughs> Next time you tell that story, though, say Matilda ran over and it fell off. Uh, yeah, no. yeah, or no. sort of took a lot, snipped it. No, no, no. No, but no, it, I will say this. I am happy to see Robot Wars coming back because it, it was you know, one of those childhood dreams of building your machine of death. I do, however, prefer the American version, BattleBots, which is a lot, a lot more, you know, frantic and mean and... Interestingly, <laughs> interestingly enough, you've shown me a clip of this and I am looking at it going, wow, it's so much more... Flywheels, ca hammers, Chaotic spikes. and explosive than yeah. the UK version of the show. I, th I originally thought we had imported Robot Wars from the States, but Ben tells me that it actually went the other way, that we created Robot Wars and then the States picked up on it. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that there were, there were some nerds way back when in their garages building their little death bots to fight against each other in supermarket <laughs> car parks. Yeah, as far as I can work out, I think it was actually, well, it was donated by an American, but it came over to us first in 1998. And then in the US, it was done in uh, the year 2000 as well. So we did get it first, yeah. So Craig Charles was, uh, I think actually maybe it was even Jeremy Clarkson was the earliest one. But um, mm. yeah, the Craig Charles is the one that everybody remembers, I think. And Pippa Forrester, I think was, that was the other presenter. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 And Daryl O'Brien is heading it up this time along with who? It's uh, Angela Scanlon. So it's Angela Scanlon and uh, Daryl O'Brien. So two Irish. Irish people. Okay. Yeah, I'm, we're I'm, taking over. I'm interested to see how Dara O'Brien deals with that. For any of you, any of you who don't know who he is, he's an Irish comedian, one of the funniest men alive. Well yeah. worth having a look at some of his stand-up stuff or the main show that he has worked on in the last few years, Mock the Week. He is incredibly funny. He even yeah. did a uh, documentary where he actually went to a LARP event for a weekend and then did, did a stand-up bit at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually oh, well. got fully done up in LARP gear. It was amazing, and I actually got to do a little bit of fighting. We, we, ha cool. we have such different tastes. Because as soon as you say, he was, and he even did a show, I thought, oh, he's going to talk about the show where he travels down the canal. Space one or something. No, maybe? he travels oh. down the canal on a boat oh, for right, like yeah. three weeks. Three men in a boat. Yeah. <laughs> three men in a boat, that's the that's one. The one. <laughs> but no, it, it was a LARP thing. Not for me, it has, it has, to, be geeky. It has to be geeky. and that, <laughs> It's fantastic. It's well worth a watch, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of humor he brings to it. Because... It wasn't the matches that made Robot Wars, it was the commentary that made it. Because it just made it sound that little bit more epic than just, oh, well, he's hit him and he's hit him. Isn't this exciting? I don't know. It was always like we're trying too hard to make this sound cooler than it actually is. I'm hoping this series can be cooler. I'm hoping we don't end up with the usual wedge with a flipper and someone just mm. rocks in with a robot but it, it was an effective epic. design. It wasn't I know, but it was effective, design. but it was boring. Everyone ended you... up... That's probably why the show got cancelled, because everyone made a wedge <laughs> with a flipper. Yeah. If you they should have, at, if you they should look have at the, categories. the news story, there's some of the uh, actual robots that are going to be showing up in there. So I think I've showed off um, three of them. And actually, while we have, we are probably going to be looking at some flippers and things like that. There are a lot of people with big spikes and all That's sorts these. of different things as well. So it looks quite cool. What is this on the back of the first one? That's a big circular saw. Yeah. Awesome. That's a double blade. But you'll notice on the front, it looks like it's a wedge with a flipper. There's a flipper <laughs> on the front there. All right, this one. It looks they have a flipper on the front, this but it one looks, looks they have a nice big claw to grab people and shift yeah. them around. This yellow one does look cool, but it looks like it's made out of Meccano. <laughs> <laughs> and our third one, okay, it's not got a flipper, Lloyd. It's got it's a big pincer claw. It's basically a big spike. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like some sort of wicked, evil... What is it? What, 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 eagle, that's it. Yeah, or An a evil hawk. eagle or a hawk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you see, I, I don't know. I would have changed the design on this one slightly because I, I would have put more of a scoop down to the front to actually let it pinch in because the way that's designed at the minute, it's going to ram in, push down, and lift itself up and not do much damage. Or if it runs into a wedge robot, it'll pinch down and the wedge will just slip, slip out from under it and it'll run away. Look at, look at the ground clearance on this thing. That's just going to charge right over the top of the wedge. You know, it's just going to do cool a little flip in the middle works. of the air. Also, if this thing flips onto its back, it is screwed. Do you know what's awesome about <laughs> this, though? It means geeks and nerds can look awesomely serious. Oh. I'm going to love watching all these people coming out and doing their pose. <laughs> oh, I, I actually met those guys as well. At... It's Carlos style. Come on, do it with me, Justin. <laughs> and that's the front screen. <laughs> I would like to see this on the tabletop, though. I yes. think having Robot Wars on the tabletop would be a lot of fun. Because... Well, it has been on the tabletop in the past. Really? Because I was having a chat with Ben about this. Ben, if you want to uh, bring us up speed. Yeah, so it did have an original board game that came out came out around sort of 2002, and it was a, a very, very sort of 
90s looking game this one it's terribly it 90s looking game very milton bradley it's, looking yeah yeah exactly it just looks like a toy shop thing yeah yeah it had some little uh cool metal miniatures and things like that and the board and stuff mm. one of the things actually that i picked up from looking at the actual game we itself, have a picture of the miniatures somewhere yeah. Uh, yeah i think they're on another page give me a sec to find them yeah but um sorry so yeah um going back to the game itself one of the things that was really cool about the uh the actual um, game itself was the dials that they were using. So it looks like they were having, they were actually looking at some sort of important things that people use in board games nowadays for sort of damage dials and things like that, and maybe speed and attack and defense and things. But as you say, it does look like a very, very simple game from the 90s. It'd be very nice to see this sort of redone, I think. There's a bigger picture of the dial sitting there, right there. We could probably yeah. bring that up. Uh, see if this works. There, there we, go. we go. Power, speed. Yeah, yeah. What's Maneuverability. Maneuverability. Yeah. So I think it's, it's one of those things where they were looking at some of the key robots that have popped up in the show so far, and they were using them as the sort of like standard um, build for what you'd use when you were playing games and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, one of the things that actually I was thinking, because I was sort of milling it around in my head and thinking about how you do this kind of thing, and it might be quite cool to actually have something that um, walks, uh, works almost in sort of like a build-your-own-robot style thing. So effectively, you started this, with like a, a this, basic robot. This is uh, exactly where I was going with yeah. this, Ben. I yeah. was looking at the, do you know the way the Mantic guys have done their, you build your robot team, you give them different arms and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was looking at this going, it'd be, it'd be really, ha like Ben says, it's really cool to have like a robot construction part uh, where you say, well, I'll have a flipper, I'll have a circular saw, I'll have this. Uh, and you arrange your robot to go into battle and you try different configurations and stuff. Actually, you know what you've reminded me of here? Uh, I remember, I think it was back in the early 2000s, there was a video game came out on the PlayStation 2 for Robot Wars. Where oh, I actually right, cool. did let you build a robot from the ground up, so you had to decide what power unit was going in, what basic mm. chassis were you working on, what weapon systems did you want to put on. That's what we're talking about. Of course, it ended up with me just building a little flipper and pissing off my brother the whole time. <laughs> because a wedge and a flipper works. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Let's go back to Ben. Ben. Yeah, but I think it would be really cool to just have potentially little uh, sort of plastic miniatures and things like that that you plugged in arms and bits, as, as you say, and things. And then what you do is you have a really nice sort of maybe potentially uh, modular board and things, so you don't have one that's effectively the same all the time. You can, like, plug in traps and things like that, so maybe there'd be a pit there or a fire trap in places like that. And, of course, you'd have the house robots and things as well that would be in the corners. And well, obviously, if you, if you went down the sort of the route of how a lot of board game pieces are done now, they'd look fantastic I don't, as well. So. I don't mind having a set arena oh, right. mm. because then you get to know strategies and stuff for arenas i think in wargaming we're too hung up on this idea of we must play on a different table every time we play mm. right because if you if you're big into rts games or shooter games and stuff on the pcs and xbox and uh, whatnot you, you right? get a map you learn a yeah map. you get a map and you learn the strategies that, that are good on that map yeah and, there you go, and then you get some benefit from that going well i know my strategy but then someone knows the counter strategy yeah. because you're playing that so if you don't have a modular board, you have that point where you, you can play the game a few times and go, I know a strategy that works like that, but then your, your friends go and work out a strategy that works against that, and I find that's another element to the depth of the game, whereas if you're constantly, you turn up and it's a completely different setup every single time, yeah. you lose that ability to be able to implement strategies that you've been able to work out. Well, you, you could always try and do something that a little bit how, like how they did with the actual TV show, where you have a standard arena size, maybe it's four separate tiles or something like that, and then on each of these tiles you've got different things that you can plug in, like in some cases they remove the pit and put a fire trap in instead or, and things. So you can still have that kind of customization of the, the, the arena itself, and maybe putting walls and things like that, yeah. but you'd still have the same game space effectively. So I if you wanted think, to play the same thing again, yeah. you could just would, put those in. But, yeah. I would like to see an expanded arena from what they had previously, because I don't want to see them just say, okay, Robot Wars is back. It's exactly the same as it was when we left you. Let's go. No, <laughs> I want to see new traps. I want to see new house robots coming into it. I want to actually see an evolution of the game, you know, because I don't want it just to be, oh, by the way, we've printed it up, you know. Well, we'll wait and see. But yeah. I do think that it, this would be really cool as a, as a hobby project, mm. sitting down and making the arena. Because if you watch the show, yeah. they've got these big perspex sheets all around it to protect the audience. I from bits and, flying off. And you could, use, you, could like, you could use acetate or something like that and build this really cool looking arena yeah. type yeah. thing and yeah, put some LED work. lights into it. Mm. And then get a yep. lighter and put a flame trap into it. <laughs> and then get a smoke pet. <laughs> And then have a whirly bird thing that cuts your finger off when you go to play. Oh, maybe that's taking it too far. Yeah, it's just <laughs> yum, yum. This a touch too far. But I, I will say for the American one, uh, I have seen robots being flipped up high and into those perspex walls. 
what makes it cool is seeing just how far they, they can go with it. Because if it's really constrained, if the rules are very, very tight for health and safety, you know, it, it does just take away from the, the awesomeness of well, it Well, they do have certain rules, like you're not allowed hard and steel. Nah. You have to stick with the soft stuff. You're not allowed to make it extra hard because it shatters and just goes everywhere all over the people yeah, when, it, yeah. when it shatters. About, uh, this, uh, this, would be, this would be one of the benefits of playing, of playing it as a board game as well, is that you could also make it that obviously if you've got bits on the robot that you've plugged into it, they can fly off. Well, I mean, not fly off, but you could pull them off and things like that, so you could actually show damaged robots and stuff, which would be very, very cool, I think. So. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I have seen robots shredded during games. I don't think I would maybe actually add that in that I'm actually pulling parts off my robot as I'm playing the game. Oh, I would no, maybe just like, have it example, as damage cards. You know, I, well, I, I, I think you're taking the fiddliness a little bit too far here, Ben. I wouldn't be in any hurry to reach down and pull any robots off, I, off the table. Yeah. I, well, I, I, don't no, think I think it'd be work. quite cool just to potentially, like, if you did have, like, a hammer on the on that you plugged into the top and someone destroyed your hammer, you could remove it so that everybody knew that you didn't have it anymore and stuff like that. I think that'd be quite cool. But, uh, no, I mean, like, you need a certain level of uh, abstraction in these games, Ben, where you're not Maybe. just literally grabbing parts of your robot and pulling them off. No, just, no, I need a card set so that I can say, okay, here is my weapon system. If I flip this over to the red side, that weapon system is now gone. It no longer exists on my robot. But yeah. if, you, if you're able to take bits off it, then you know, but first glance, you don't even have to look at their cards. You can just tell that they've lost their Yeah, but if, if you have a nice, clear little dashboard on the Is other side, it's fine. Is anybody clear what they're talking about anymore? <laughs> we're, we're talking about damage systems. So what Ben wants to do is actually have a modular miniature system yes. built into the game where you can actually pull the components off your robot as they get damaged. Yes. What I'm saying is, no, that's too fiddly. What you need is a nice dashboard with your weapon systems laid out in card format. Flip it over to red. You know that weapon system is now gone. Oh, I thought he meant he wanted to pull robots off, as in off the table altogether. No, 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 no. Well, no, you no, want no. you want them to stay there till absolute he, destruction. He's wanting to take weapon systems and armor systems and stuff off. I think you will be fiddling about trying to just get those tiny little nah, bits nah, pulled nah. off. Card no. based, just like Dustin, you just discard cards as your yeah. weapons go to the bin. Oh, yeah. never mind. Yeah, <laughs> you've done so, lost your stabby thing. In the yeah, bin. yeah. Flip it to its red side. It's now gone. Right, moving on because mm. robot war, war, robot wars looks cool and stuff. Is there an actual? Date of when it's going to broadcast yet? Yeah, so this will be out on July 24th. So this, this will be out on this Sunday, so, you know, tomorrow. Uh, Actually, yeah, so. mm. is it going to be out tomorrow? It is, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. much in that. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll it's see gonna... if it's any good. we come back next week and tell you it's crap. Yeah. <laughs> or we can come back next week and give you the thumbs up. Just look at how cool their little trailer on their main website looks, though. Once you actually get running through it, you see stuff being mashed and mangled and thrown into the air. I mean, like, for me, this is what makes Robot Wars. It's just, there you go, there's your poses, Lloyd. Yeah. You know, and then you've got all the traps and stuff, and it's, it's just that moment of, yes, mangled metal, yes. I like the fact that they've still got spikes coming up. Yeah. Because you don't really want them up. Them? Well, you don't want them up your robot. Yeah, they don't like them up them. Nope, they don't like it up them at all. I, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. I'll tell you what, though, right? I'm taking a pinch of salt with it, though. He's taking a pinch of salt. This, well, this works. Your big mech robot shooting paintballs at stuffy, Justin, I still think that's a stupid idea. The, the date for that is fast approaching. It is happening. Is it, it going it, to happen ever? It is actually happening because the Americans challenged the Japanese. This was a bad plan, by the way, America. This was a very bad plan. You have challenged the Japanese to a giant robot fight. If we have learned one thing from anime, the Japanese do giant robots very, very well. It's not a... Or did they actually say yes, we they will... They did. Wait, no, wait. They have accepted. <laughs> let me ask the question. Right. <laughs> did they say yes, we will let you hit us with hammers and stuff, or is it still all paintball based? The Japanese have said, we want melee. So yes, melee is happening. They it's are currently happening. redesigning the Mark II, or they're probably in the middle of fabrication of the Mark II to actually give it some... Yeah. Let's stick to Robot Wars. Let's stick to something realistic. But this is Ultimate Robot Wars. This is it's one to one skill robot. Not, it's going to end up crap because some guy's inside it and they can't go to the extremes. Oh, I think it's going to be as soon, put, as soon as you put a squishy flesh ball inside the robot, <laughs> more rules. <laughs> I, I, I suppose that... No, no hard I, on steel. I will give it to you. I will no, give it to you. no, no piercy, piercy things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just no paintballs. Well, I don't think it's going to be paintballs because they are saying melee. Like, uh, oh, right. the, the melee, guy from they'll probably end up being a giant sword made of foam. It'll just be a big, larping robot. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> wait and see, wait and see. The, the time is coming. Megabots, if you need a pilot or someone Megabots. from the crew, give me a shout, okay? That's what it's called. Yeah. Let's not go any further. All right, ben, fair enough. Ben, another story that's coming out of the site next week is Foreground's Gen Con releases. 
Yeah, so uh, Foreground are going to be at Gen Con, and they're going to be bringing um, their Karakheim terrain and their Grimstack stuff as well. But one of the big things that they're doing is they're going to be giving away a whole bunch of different freebies as well. So uh, if you um, actually go there and you spend any money on buying any of the regular Foreground purchases, then you're going to get yourself... Um, what's called the Eightfold Path Beast Wagon. So if you might remember, we looked at some artwork for this, uh, I think it was last week, and uh, this mm. is one of the realizations of their terrain that they've been working on for this sort of this background and this mythos within their world. So yeah, this is their really cool beast wagon that you'll be dragging around the monsters and stuff in, which is very, very, very cool. Awesome. Do we know anything about these miniatures that we're seeing? Uh, they're just from a different range. I'm not entirely sure what they're from, but they're, uh, they're a, another fantasy range out there. Yeah. So yeah, Just something that fits really, really well with it. Well yeah. spent. Uh, so as well as that, if you buy any Frostgrave stuff from them, because they're going to be stocking that at the event, uh, then you can actually pick up the free wizard screen from those guys as well. So this is basically a way to uh, record your warband. It's a little bit like a roster, effectively. Mm. But it's a little bit more sort of sturdy and things like that, rather than just having a piece of A4 or whatever and just losing it and stuff, yeah. So which is very, very cool. Mm -hmm. And um, finally as well, they're also going to be stocking some Chicago Way stuff, which is from Great Escape Games. I think we've talked about these guys before we have, on yeah. the show, and we really, really like the idea of this. And they're going to be giving away the photographer miniature if you buy some uh, Chicago Way stuff. Now, why are they doing all this, Ben? I, is it, is it, am I right in thinking it's because they're taking additional stock with them from these other companies with them? Yes, so they're going to be bringing stock from the guys at Osprey and North Star for Frostgrave and the Great Escape Games guys for Chicago Way, and they'll be selling it on their behalf at the event. So you'll be able to go and pick up a whole bunch of different things. And importantly as well, if you buy from all three of these different ranges or two of them or whatever, you'll get the free stuff, whatever combination of stuff you pick up. Pretty cool. Cool. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Right. That, I think that wraps it up for the news. Okay. Yeah. Right. Let's take a quick break and then we're going to be back to talk about Mantic stepping into the historical gaming sector. Ooh. Ooh. Is it right? It's time for 28mm World War II action. Will you recreate history or reshape it your way? On the Bolt Action Hub at beastsofwar.com. Humanity has been driven from Earth, but now it's time to take it back. Join the Reconquest and fight the Scourge on the Drop Zone Commander Hub at beastsofwar.com. Mantic look like they're going to be doing some historical stuff. If not officially, officially, certainly sort of sanctioned. Officially. Official ish. Official ish. Okay. Now I was I was I was chatting to Jerry at the game at our, at our gaming thing last, last week, yeah. Sunday. Yep. Um Averus Avernos Avernos from the web from the website. You may yeah, yeah. have you may have commented or chatted with him in the past. Top bloke yep. knows all about all sorts of amazing stuff. Yeah, and we got onto a conversation about uh, Romans and stuff because you know that idea I have about the Roman army still kicking around in my head. <laughs> I <laughs> thought I thought I'd put it to bed. I thought yeah, yeah I've put that to bed in, in favor of going of going you know the, the dark age route with you guys. Yeah. And then he had to open his mouth and start talking about his Roman army and talking about the elephants and everything he has in his Roman army. And, and I'm like, Romans and Mantic. No! Or Romans no, and Kings of War. No! Why have you done this to me, Jerry? No! You've, you've reignited this are, idea. Are you, are you on the hunt for Romans again? I am on the hunt for Romans. But he then started talking about, well, we'll play it with, um, we'll play it with Mantic rules and stuff. Right. And I thought, oh, all right, okay, yeah, so we can just... It's not so we can just weird. take the armies of man or something and map it onto the Romans. He said, no, 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 you don't need to do that. Because there, there is, there's a section of people mm. working away on a oh, set of so. rules that will allow you to play ancient stuff using the Kings of War rules. Ben, right. you can bring us a little bit more speed on it. What, yeah, what are we sure. talking so, about? Um, what's been going on with this is that um, as of sort of around the 3rd of June, this, uh, well, last month now, um, there was some talk about the Rules Committee working on some rules that um, had originally been worked on by uh, Alessio Cavatore. And this is effectively going to be a way for them to use the very basics of the Kings of War system, but add on a historical aspect to it. And they're going about it in a few very interesting different ways. So, yeah, uh, uh, the stuff we're looking at yeah. is the stuff that's currently out, but it's not, it's not an official set, and it, this isn't what we're going to be looking at. Mm. Yeah. This is just for us to have a flavor at. We're looking at these PDFs and stuff that already exist. Yeah, so this is from An Hour of Wolves and Shattered Shields, and this was a fan sort of project that came up where they um, decided to go through a, diff a whole bunch of different armies that people had requested and whole different sort of eras and things like that and make up PDFs and things which use the, um, uh, the Kings of War 1st edition rules and I think now they work with the Kings of War 2nd edition rules as well. Yeah. But so this, some, yeah. this is more, of, uh, more official than, than that 
Uh, this is this one that's coming up now is going to be a lot more official, yes, because it's been sort of sanctioned by the rules committee, which are sort of working alongside Mantic very, very closely at their offices and their studios and things like that. So this is going to be a very. I, I'd imagine we might actually see something from the actual guys at Mantic from this, rather than from a, a second party or something. So it'll be very, very interesting to see where this one goes. Yeah. Yeah, because as I understand it, Alessio was working on this rule set, and now they've handed it over to the rules committee to to take yes. it and and finalize bits and pieces and stuff mm. to it. So yeah. this guy, Chris uh, Nichols, Nichol, Nichols that you've been talking to. Yeah, so Chris Nichols, um, one of the guys that, well, he's the, he's the mind behind Macrocosm Games, so you might know him uh, from some of our past stories and things like that, was talking to me a little bit about this, and he was saying that one of the big things that they're going to be doing is that there's going to be no independent army lists, as it were. So there will be no Roman army list, a Greek army list, a Viking one, a Napoleonic British one or whatever. This, is, this, is, this is where it gets interesting, because in history you could go anywhere yeah essentially you wouldn't have time to sit and write up hundreds of different lists so i yeah, kind of like this approach that they're going for with this mm. this plug and play approach i'm going to go back to ben before we come to you let's let's hear from ben yeah so this is the as you say it's going to be very plug and play so effectively what's going to happen is there will be unit types for example so it might just be a block of soldiers infantry if you want and then what you'll do is you'll plug in army attributes to these which will allow them to uh, play in different styles so if you wanted to play a very greek force then you might plug in something to make them spearmen or give them hoplite rules and shield walls and stuff if you wanted to play uh, a unit of ranged uh, infantry, and you wanted them to have muskets, then you plug in something from the po Napoleonic yeah. period and things like that. So instead, okay. of, so instead of yeah. just taking a Mantic army that exists, let's mm. say Kingdom of Men, and yeah. going, that unit is similar-ish to this unit, you literally look at the unit of historical stuff you've got and go, mm. this guy's with spears and shields, yeah. let's yeah. go and look yeah. at the attributes, let's give them those attributes. It's well, guys with muskets, mm. let's look at the attributes, let's give them that attribute. Yeah, exactly, well, like, yeah. If, if you look at it, a human is still a human, regardless of what era of history you're looking at. You're going to have the same rough stat line. What's going to change is your gear and maybe your tactics. So if you're going to play Romans like you want to do, Lloyd, you're going to have something maybe along the lines of, you know, the Testudo or having the big standard bearers out there, having special rules to add to your forces. So, yeah, I can definitely understand where they're going with this. Uh, I'm interested to see how it breaks down. To, what level does it break down to? Do, will it cover likes of standard bearers? Do the standard bearers have an effect in Kings of War? They did in the first edition. They removed it in the second edition. Because in, in the first edition, you would have your musician, your standard bearer, and your champion in the front rank of your unit. And each of those, if you had them in the unit, would give you a bonus. Yeah. Now, I think if they're doing this and going down this line, the standard bearers within the Roman army, they were a very, very key central piece of it. So I would be very surprised not to see it, but it has been in there and it has been removed from Mark II. So it might be out, it might be in. I'm well, not they, well, they sure. probably don't need it because there are lots of rule sets out there for playing Napoleonic Wars. Well, yeah. I'm talking Ro Roman. Roman Wars. Yeah. I'm just making an example. Yeah, yeah. You know, all sorts of wars where they go into detail and they, and they probably go into formations like we're going to change formation, we're going we're gonna to form a square and all this mm. sort of stuff. I don't want to do any of that. I want to dip my toe into historical gaming the easy way. And I think using a King of War rule set... Mm made or tweaked towards my historicals is a good way to go well, it, yeah. it because, does, it because it's sense. pretty streamlined mm -hmm. you know, and it's pretty effective at just getting a, a good game underway and it doesn't bog itself down in this formation changed into this formation and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm looking at it because I sometimes, I do, you guys talk about doing more historical stuff, but I find that I keep running up against barriers when I'm trying to get into it. Aye. So I want to do the Roman stuff, yeah. right? So then I go off, uh, I start thinking, well, I'll start, I'll start looking at the uh, Romans and things. Right. And then I'm looking at it going, but I don't know what range to go for. Right. You know, there's Warlord stuff, there's Vitrix stuff. Yeah. Which, yeah. The, which... the key with this is, if we do it Mantic style, shall we call it, you only have to worry about your footprint, because that's the key core mechanic of the game, is it's a footprint of a unit. So even if you didn't have, say you had a, a unit of Slingers for the Romans, you wouldn't have to fill the entire base with flat ranks of slingers trying to sling stuff. You could do a nice little sort of diorama thing and actually have them a little bit spread out and a little more dynamic and things like that. So you do have a little bit more freedom. Well, with I still that. want to rank them up. You know, I still love the look of the Roman army just ranked up as if it's marching yeah, if, into if battle. It's your, if it's your standard centurion, yes, you're definitely going to do it. But that what way. I mean is, less barriers is good for the historical side of things mm. because I'm, I'm looking at, I'm talking to Jerry, and then he went home. And then I was looking around, and we had some Egyptian stuff in the office, and I thought, oh, Egyptian army, that'd be cool. And then I yeah. messaged Jerry back, and he says, yeah, Romans and Egyptians could fight, except they're about a thousand years out of sync with each other. And I was like, 
Ah, balls. I mean, you see, that, that's that doesn't work. Though. So then I went, what about Spartans? And I thought, oh, I'll go and have a look for Spartans because mm. Spartans look cool. They look like just as cool as Romans, uh, essentially. Yeah. And I thought, if he's going Romans, maybe I'll go Spartan. So then I started doing some searching online. And again, it was like, well, they didn't really fight each other. Mm. As far as I'm aware, they may have had an encounter or something. And that's where you could go into the maybe they had an encounter sort of thing. Yeah, this, is, I, this is what grinds my gears about historical. In so much as I, maybe I'm getting caught up on it. Maybe I'm being too, too nerdy, too beardy with this going, well, I'm not sure if I want to have you know, see, armies fighting each other that a thousand years separates them. Yeah, but hang on. Uh, let's be honest here. If you're playing ancient armies with mantic rules, there's nothing to say these guys couldn't turn up against an orc army because they will work against each no, other. You're missing my point. My point is, that's great. I'm just saying... This Mantic rule set in Kings of War could be the perfect way to get into historical wargame because there's enough pitfalls getting into historical wargame, in my opinion. You don't need complicated rules set. Yeah, this lets you sort of ignore that is what I'm trying to say. Fine, that was maybe an extreme you know, suggestion, having orcs versus Romans. But there's nothing to say that within this sort of fantasy-esque world, you could have the Romans versus the Spartans, have them versus the Egyptians. You know, there would be... There'd be less of that, ah, they wouldn't have thought. You can actually see that what-if scenario of what would have happened if the, the Romans had marched into to Egypt and actually you know, had a bit of a big-ass dust-up with a massive army. I think, I think potentially what we might see with this, and this is something that I, I, I assume they might go down, is that they might have lists to try to sort of indicate to you the types of armies that would have fought each other. So, for example, you might have suggestions within the book or the PDF or whatever they go for with this that'll say if you wanted to play ancient period battles you might have the Romans, some of the Greek states, you know, you know, Gauls and the Celts and stuff like that. If you wanted to play Dark Ages, you would have the Scots, the Picts and things and the Anglo Saxons, the Vikings and whatever. So they'll give you sort of the easy way in, I'd imagine, to help you get get into this. But I think the effectively what they're gonna try and do with this is make it so that if you were really interested in getting into historical wargaming, but you didn't want to learn a new set of rules, and you didn't want to have to get yourself, you know, stuck into the minutia of trying to work out whether or not it should be, you know, late or early or whatever like that, you could just sit down and just make a Roman army and a Greek army and just battle them against each other and just see how it goes with a rather simple and effective uh, rule set that, that uh, Mantic have. So. Uh, I tell you what, I know exactly the army I want to have to fight your Romans like. I want to have cavemen running at you with clubs and sticks and stones. <laughs> cavemen. What an image. Tell... I'd have battle mammoths. It's great. Battle mammoths. Battle mammoths. Now, this is what's really, called really... fantasy, uh, well, Justin. Yes, <laughs> but I don't mind. I'm not saying, I'm not getting prickly about this. I'm saying I love the idea of having my straight up Romans uh, using the Kings of War rules to have straight up sort of historical yeah battles and then... Uh, some other weekend, I'll throw some random unit into the into the into the Romans, and then we'll we'll have something a bit more fantasy esque going on. I have something just for you, Lloyd. Do you, may, you may remember these. You want a fantasy esque unit? I have something just for you right here. Do you remember this, everybody? We have Romans on bears from Archean Legion. Romans on bears. <laughs> yeah, here, take those because there is nothing to say that you couldn't have your armies of Rome with some bear cavalry. You know facing off against my orcs. I haven't seen these in ages. Yeah. Uh, Romans on bears. Romans on bears, yes. Do you know what? It's... As much as the crappy sculpts on this, I might steal these Romans on bears. Yeah. This, this is where someone would just say, though, that you should use this army for your Kings of War games. No, no. And then play historical with historical units. <laughs> no, Ben, we're having fun. This is our kind of fun. It is out of the box. It is insane. It means you can play damn near anything versus damn near anything. I think it'll be cool and amazing. <laughs> this Arcane Legion stuff, though, highlights a point mm. for me, right? Because if I cut to it yeah. on, on the camera here, you can see this guy here. Yeah. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for Romans that have, <clears throat> they have the, the heroic scale to them. Ah, I because see. I've been spoiled looking at the Mantic armies growing up in Games Workshop. Um, the bold Everything has stuff. That, that heavy 20 I like I like that historic, or I, lo I like that heroic, heroic proportion. Yeah. That they have going on, and and I and I opened some st I've opened some historical stuff that we have sitting around the office, and I went, that looks tiny. It doesn't have the 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 heroic proportions to it. Yeah, but d the don't forget, you're trying to fit something that is from another range, perhaps for another rule system, 
and try and crowbar that in somewhere else where there's already a, a design for well, it. So I, you are uh, going to have to look around a lot just to find what you're really the after. Stuff, the stuff that you act, the Romans and things like that that you can get from Warlord aren't they? While they are effectively true scale, they do have a heroic sort of property to them. Effectively, well, that's what like, I'm hoping. So, I haven't mm. seen up close Romans from Warlord. Aye. They're, they're I haven't, very good, I haven't actually. seen they, up they, close uh, Romans from Vetrix and stuff, mm. right? But I have seen some, I've seen other ranges and stuff, and the, and the, and the miniatures were tiny, Aye. right? I do have, you know, because I've got, I've got some miniatures here to highlight the, the problem. Like, yeah. here, let's take a let, crappy range, but let's look at this guy here, right? Yeah. What I don't want is Romans that look like that, but if you compare it to the stuff that you guys have for, for Saga and stuff, he yeah. looks tiny. Most, yeah. most of the time what you'll see within a lot of the ranges that Warlord do in Vitrix and things like that, and Foot Saw, for example, and Gripping Beast, they all do ranges that are very much similar in scale. Yeah. So you actually won't have too much of a problem when it comes to this kind of thing because, I mean, uh, obviously you've seen a lot of the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons and things like that for the Dark Age rules. They're all fairly similar in style. I mean, occasionally the metal models might be a little bit bigger or a little bit more sort of heroically scaled. Well, this is what like Jerry that. was saying to me. He says, Lord, you may have to give up on this love of plastic. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. If you want that heroic proportion... In you the may historical need to go stuff. metal. You may need to go metal because the metal models tend, generally tend yeah. to just be that, that a bit chunkier. Yeah. Like, what, like um, what I've got uh, here. I've got some stuff under the, under the camera. For example, there's your Games Workshop standard yeah. ace model. Okay? Standard Karachin uh, Trooper, yeah. Now we've got um, Bolt Action. Yeah. That's got the sort of proportions that I'm looking for. This model, Justin, is this one of yours or what's uh, this? No, no, that's one of the Studio Saga miniatures. Because yeah. I think Saga's perfect. If I could find Romans that look like that, now, again, I haven't seen the Warlord Romans up close. Maybe they're already that scale. They're, they're but, pretty much that scale. So if well, you're looking for models like that, get the Warlord ones. And that's like perfect, that. because mm -hmm. I do have the Warlord French Old Guard Grenadiers um, mm -hmm. with me. I'll just throw them under this. Yeah, yeah. Where's the box? Can you throw it so, in there for me, Justin? Yeah, there. So we've got your Grenadiers. Now, these guys are in metal, yeah? Yes. So, so if you, I, the box doesn't define me. I'll just I'll get one of them out here. I, I've got the close cam, so just give it to me. All right. Now I opened this box and I thought, do you know what? These guys look perfect. So if we can get some Romans in, th that may just be the way to go. For example, I mean, well, I've, mind, got, I've got a close cam segment. They look great. That's, that's just about the right sort of size that I want. Mm. But I haven't yet seen the Romans up close. So if anybody's got the Games Workshop, or sorry, not Games Workshop, the, the Warlord, Warlord Games, games um, Romans, or the Vetrix, Early Romans, because I know they're coming out with their Imperial Romans and stuff like that. Drop some pictures alongside some Games Workshop models for me in the comments below, and I can look at the ranges and go, do you know what? That's it. That's where I want to go. I will say one thing for this guy. He has a glorious mustache. Yes. I really, yeah. like, I really like this, this, yeah, this French really Old nice. Guard stuff. It's got a real nice sort of scale to it. And again, with this, you could be using the... This, yeah, this yeah, new you can rank these Wars, guys up, not a problem. This new Kings of War army building system to play this stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you, can still, a, a, obviously a, you can still play Black Powder and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a very, is, it's a very um, popular way of doing things now with this sort of modular fitting things in style of thing because there's a game out there called Open Combat which does something very similar to this but on a skirmish style, scale. So effectively what you could even look at doing is using something like that and this to play that sort of Skirmish level and, a, and then a larger battle scales with the same kind of plug-in feel to it and things So you'd have both things covered really But I wanted to go back to one of the things that Justin had said about sort of the way in which you create units within Kings of War You know where you use the, uh, the sort of the footprint effectively Which means that you could go for a lot more of the metal models, but not feel like you had to make full Regiments of stuff and things like that because you could do more diorama style things with less minute less metal models And not feel like you're just having to slog through a whole bunch of stuff and things so I don't yeah, know it, well, if I'm if I'm doing the Roman stuff It's that regimented. Oh, yeah, like you, you're wanting that block of red shields just <laughs> flat running towards you. Yeah. Yeah I'm not obviously the full is it a cohort they call it? Yes, legionary yeah. cohorts yeah. obviously not the full one because you, you it would be 80 men in total or yeah. is it 80 men? It's, well, it's, it's 100 see, men, isn't it's, it? It's, uh, generally but it's 100 men minus 2 because there was two support guys. Right. Jerry was telling me about this. That's why. Oh, right. okay. oh I can't remember. He was saying something about <laughs> the reason it's called a, a, a sentry is because they've got extra guys who don't actually go and fight. Yeah, well, right. the, the one thing you have I'm to remember butchering is history. the footprint in Kings of War is not representative of how many actual miniatures are on the table. 
Yeah, you know, I know that. I've got, I've got this concept. You there. don't need to try and teach me this concept. I know it. Yeah. I'm just saying, guys, that if I was going to do it, I would do it ranked up because Roman yeah, yeah. Army, right. in my mind, is ranked up, marching into battle. Yeah. It's not 10 guys on a base. I'm Unless just, it's I'm, a skirmisher force from the Romans. No, I want the, fra <laughs> I want the ranked up army. I don't want no skirmish thing. Really? Yeah. Well, so you, if I was going to play skirmish you, Romans, I'd just go... No, no, no. I mean a skirmisher unit. So in the Roman army, you would have had your legionaries who... We're trying to run in that big block uh, you unit. See, no, but then no, you would have had guys nah, like the Slingers nah, nah. who would be running around a little bit more scattered nah, in a different formation. Now I think you're thinking of uh, um, Republican Romans, right? Because Quite I possibly. Also, I could be wrong on this. I was also having a chat with Jerry mm. and he was talking about how the Roman army changed its approach to warfare mm. away from having specific units for specific tasks to every unit could handle every situation it was in. Ah. So, there, so instead of having particular units who did particular tasks, Aye. everybody in the regiment just was one or so in what, the they cohort. they were all armed with everything? Well, they could do everything they needed to do, right? I, I'm not a history buff, but he was talking about back in the early days, they would have, do you know the way you, some games you have this impetuous thing? Aye. Where like less trained troops and stuff will be impetuous yeah. and run over the, run oh, away and, oh, yeah, yeah, and go no, and that's, do. That's not impetuous. I'm, I'm, using my, I'm using my knowledge of Rome Total War what here, but I, th I think what the whole idea was that in the early days they would have had the standard Roman troopers and then the rest of them would have been what's called auxilia. And so they would have been drawn from different uh, sort of portions of the Roman Empire and sort of drafted in to be skirmishers or maybe like cavalry and things like that. And then obviously, as, as Lloyd was saying, maybe at later points, this was condensed down to be a more standard Roman force I'm that getting, could deal with a lot of different situations. I'm getting to an interesting point. Mm. In Republic Rome, according yeah. to Jerry, when I was having a chat with him, okay. top bloke, by the way, if I haven't said that, yeah. <laughs> right? He was, ta he was saying that um, it used to be a case of, do you know, I like, let me finish my point, right? In games, he says, sometimes you can have it, there's an impetuous role or something. Why do you say it's not impetuous? Uh, impetuous, if I remember correctly, is meant to be that they're a more aggressive troop. You know, if they're, I remember correctly. They're, they're, no, it just means they're less predictable. Okay. Is it not, Ben? I think that's, it's in the yeah. same sense. Same yeah. sort of sense. More aggressive, anyway. less, less Do you know the way we have this idea that less trained troops will be like that? Yeah. yeah. Back in the day, back in Rome in the day, yeah. they used to send the, the less trained troops in first. Yeah. The cannon fodder. And what happened was the veterans got bloody well bored Aye. and they became the troops who started doing things randomly because they were so bored standing at the back Aye. because the first troops they could send in, the less well-trained troops could wipe up, could probably do the job and there all the veterans are just kind of standing around. I'm sorry, I would so be... So they were the ones going off doing random stuff I would be and you turn, and you'd turn around that. and go, where the heck did all my veterans go? I would be quite content with that. <laughs> oh, look, the young bloods are running in again, lads. Don't worry, we're drawing our wages this week anyway. We'll be fine. Oh, anyway. look, there goes another one. Ah, you get stabbed. Back. Oh, wait, too many get stabbed. Now we're going in. Right, lads, game face. <laughs> Back to butchering history. That's what this should be called, this show. Butchering it shouldn't be called history. the weekend. It should be called butchering history. <laughs> but back, I mean, to butchering, back, to the... back to butchering history. I think yeah. this is why they then changed the way the Roman army worked. Mm. So they didn't have this moment of, you're holding troops back and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, comment, um, comment below and correct every damn thing I just said. <laughs> Going back to the, the whole sort of uh, King's War historical, mantic historical thing as well, I think one of the big things that this is effectively shown even through this discussion here is that if you want to dip your toe into, into historical, this might be a really good way of doing so. Because you could go out and pick up maybe two boxes of Roman infantry or or a unit of Roman infantry and then some you know, skirmishes or whatever, like whatever you wanted to do. And you could just sit down and make these two units up in the way that you need to use the army attributes, collect a hero, paint him up and use him in the style and whatever, and you know, make a little tiny skirmish force effectively, and just play out some battles in different eras of history and see whether or not you like them. And then you'll also learn about what army attributes work and what you might want to switch out and things like yeah. that as well. So I think this could be effectively a, what, you know, a toolkit for learning to enjoy certain aspects and then, of ancient history. So. And you can also fantasy it up, because he was saying that he, has a, uh, he has a mate who's got like a, a French mm. a Napole a Napoleonic army. Yeah. But what he's done is, <laughs> funny we should be talking about Romans on bears, he's taken French riders with swords and stuck them on bears. Oh, <laughs> so he, for his fantasy element to his army to play with the Kings of War rule side. Right. Now, the one issue I've always had with some of this more ancient style warfare is, it, it always feels more strict. You know, you have to get the colors right. You have to get, you know, sort of the weapons, the chariots, all that kind of stuff. You have to be that bit more accurate with it. Doing it via this Kings of War-ish route, 
I get the feeling you could be a little bit freer with it. Yeah, it you gives know. you the get out of car, get out of jail free card. Because it, it's not <laughs> heavy duty historical. Well, well it, it might it actually turn out to be heavy duty historical. I, we don't know yet because we don't it, have the book yet. It depends which way. Effectively, as I said, this is a toolkit. So if you wanted to go down this route of being very casual, like you guys are talking about, and do it in a sort of very open sense, then you could. But if the game rules are, you know, solid, and they are, because it's the very effective Kings of War rule system that we're, we're basing things off of this, that means that you could probably have very, very good historical games with this setting as well. And you know, feel like you're playing a you know a proper historical game and not feeling like you're cheaping out and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I think I think it'd be really good for for all sides of the coin. Yeah, but so, what I'm trying to say is you're not having that that feeling of intimidation that I sometimes yeah, do. Yeah. Before I started playing World War II, I was always really intimidated by trying to create an army for it because I thought, oh, the amount of research I have to do just to get into this, this yeah. that's kind of a stumbling block for me. But I mean, like then bolt action came along, and it was just like, oh, I can create a, a really nice little German army. Okay, here's a, a rough period of history. Here's my guys. Perfect, I can play games. That's what I yeah. want and hope for from this system now. Yeah, it, it should deliver on it. So, yeah, yeah. baby steps. Yeah. If, if I can have this treatment of meeting people who do who actually play Romans, mm. who send me cool videos of explaining how the army instructor is based, uh. Uh, having the mantic stuff. Uh. I could have my whip, myself whipped into shape for the for the start of the next century. The, the speed you actually get projects done at, yeah, exactly. Oh. Well, let's take a break, and then we're going to move on to Kickstarters for this week. In a world controlled by massive corporations, a steady aim and split-second decisions are needed for your Megacon to complete its goals. Begin your missions at the Mercs Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Enter into the dangerous dungeons of myth as a mighty hero and stand against the darkness. Visit the Myth Hub on BeastsOfWar.com and begin your story. Okay, time to take our weekly look at some Kickstarters. All right. Uh, what is setting the world on fire for you fellas? Ben, uh, do you want to tell us what this first one is? Yeah, sure. So the first one we're going to look at is called Mauser Earth. And this is the new skirmish game that's being bought out by Wonderlands Project. And this is a very, very interesting looking game, this one. Yeah. Now you're saying new. I have seen Mauser Earth before. Is there actual game part to it and there wasn't before? Yeah, the, the original was just a selection of miniatures that you could pick up. And they were for uh, paint, painters and collectors and all sorts of different things. But now you can actually pick up a, a proper game for this with the Kickstarter and stuff like that to use all these miniatures in. So yeah, it's looking yeah. really, really cool. You know, I like I like the look of the American or the Atlantic Alliance forces here. Uh, Lloyd Hound, don't you have this many? I absolutely do. And what's his name again? Streetbot Willie. All right, I love my Willie. Right, <laughs> but unfortunately, I've never had the time to paint my Willie. Right, and I've had my Willie out on the show like at least three times before. Yeah, d and I'll it... get him out today as well. Because I have them here. Right. Does this thing keep getting lost on transit back to your home? No, I, I keep meaning to take it home and get it painted is up, it, but you know. I, mean, like, I remember when you moving, bought Moving this. houses and stuff just is, is prohibitive yeah. to getting stuff done. Yes. Right? <laughs> so it's this guy here, the yellow. Yeah, with a really cool looking grenade launcher on him. It's very, very cool. I actually have this many, but I can't get the pack open now, for goodness sake. Oh, here we go. Right. So oh, he comes in a lot of bits. He does come in a lot of bits. I will just quickly put that under camera for you guys to all see. It's a sweet looking model though. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool little sort of steampunky weird World War-esque robot. But hard yeah. to get the, the grasp of him when he's in that many bits. Aye. The funny thing is, I was wandering around the studio here the week, this week, Aye. moaning that I hadn't been able to get painting because of problems at the house and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I was wandering around Ben, looking through tubs and stuff going, what can I paint? Yeah. <laughs> what can I build and paint this week that wouldn't be like tax, ta taxing? Yeah. It yeah. wouldn't mean I have to end up sitting down painting rows and rows of men and stuff. Yeah. Straight bought Willy. I never Round thought of painting my <laughs> Willy this week. Yeah, yeah but hang on, you keep losing your Willy, which is the, the big problem here. I, mean, I remember whenever Lloyd bought this, it was on our first ever trip across to England. Because yeah. it was my first ever trip with Beasts of War to Games Day 2010. Yeah. We stopped off at a gaming store in the middle of England. We were wandering around me, I was going, oh, shiny, there's minis everywhere. This is a gaming store? That You have a store for this? Oh, my God, it's amazing. Uh, while Lloyd was looking around going, yeah, hey, what's this? What's this? What's let this? me just clarify. Ah, let, like me, let me just clarify that for you. The reason that is exciting, because here in Northern Ireland, we do not have a lot of gaming <laughs> stores. Yeah. You've got to travel 
60, 70 miles to get to a, ga a games workshop. Yeah, Belfast. Right. And you know, I was, you're about an hour away from your local gaming store. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a real pain in the behind. Yeah, yeah and this was me bright eyed and shiny whenever you know, well, bright eyed when the shiny syndrome was, was at its worst. Just going, oh my god, I want everything, but I don't have the money. But that tells you how old this range actually is. Are you sure they never did a game for this Ben? I'm not entirely. Sure. I, I don't think they did. I'm, as far as I remember, it was just a bunch of sort of collectors items, effectively, because they're all fifty millimeters as well, which is uh, the big thing about this. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, but the uh, great thing about this is the is the is the scale of the men. Yeah. Right, because sometimes it's just like that. It's a bit sort of featurettes, mm -hmm. uh, and like like you say here, Justin, the Atlantic Alliance looks really sweet. Of course, I think it's sweet because I have the street bought Willie. Yeah. But as we go further down, you'll see even more stuff. I like the Reich starter. I love the dog soldiers. They're very, very mean and the, very, very cool looking. This is obviously right up my alley. Uh, Otherwise, I would never have bought that that street bought Willie. Yeah. Because got... because it's got that that. It's that weird World War. This is weird World War One ish, isn't it? It's kind of got yeah. a diesel punk feel to it. You know, I mean, yeah. if you look at the Theo Soviets here, it's very World War One esque, but yeah. there's a bit of more extra modernization and a bit of the over the top stuff going on there, which is really cool. Yeah, uh, so uh, I mean, as Justin said, this is this is definitely what they call diesel punk. It's set within the Uchronic universe, mm -hmm. and the whole idea behind this actually is that uh, World War One continued to carry to well, the conflict continued effectively, and it was still going in 1938. And what's happened here is that um, while the war is going on, there are actually companies starting to take control of different areas and stuff like that. And one of them is called the Railroad World Company, mm. and they have been sort of encasing cities in these huge domes to protect them from the gases and the horrible things outside. But within, they are corrupting them and taking control as corporations mm. and the whole idea in this game is you're going to be playing as one of these different factions who are fighting for control of the city of paris which is very very awesome i kind of like that idea of a big i'm assuming it would be like a big eiffel tower style dome well, with, maybe all, maybe the, has with a, all the metal girders and all yeah. the all the <laughs> oh, rivets yeah, yeah. and stuff yeah. Yeah. yeah although you were talking about skill lloyd and there's an there's an image right here which is actually showing it against some recognizable minis and you can see that this looks to be a standard guy, you know, regular trooper. Yep. Not regular, he's a little bit messed up. But he's standing <laughs> there and he's he's huge. And this looks like it's gonna be really, really nice and easy to paint yeah, because you have those nice bigger details. This to work is a with. this is a fifty mil game. Ben, yeah, isn't fifty it? mil, yeah. And as you can see, I like that. I like the odds, especially for this particular skirmish game. When you see this, yeah. where you're not going to have a lot of characters, it's it's even like even Volsung and Wild West Exodus and stuff scaled up. They didn't go as big as this. No, no, they're they're a 32 mil game. But I think for, I think it's a nice change from little miniatures. No, whoa, whoa, I didn't get that up on the screen. Bring this up. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. So that's one of your Willy bots. I'm guessing you could call these. And if, it, according to this, it's standing about what? Eight centimeters tall. Yeah, he's not my willy. You'll find out what he's called later. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, it it does stand quite the height. It's it's nice, big, chunky miniatures that you're going to be moving. Is this around some the war top. machine beside it, or what's that? I believe that's a. It looks to be a war jack. I think it looks it's like a, some sort a mercenary of war one. It I'm, is an I'm old war jack. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure, yeah. but I mean, like, it's all running off stat cards, which is fantastic because you know me. I think stat cards are the best way to actually run a game system to build your army list and stuff. All your information is laid out nicely in front of you. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, scrolling on down. Okay, we're on to some of the add-ons. So we've got four starter factions to begin with. Yeah, Ben? Now, here we go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, the starter factions. Mm. The thing, I bought this one miniature, right? Yeah. But to buy any more, I thought it was a bit cost prohibitive. Mm. Okay, at the time. Yeah. The starter faction, I think, is actually quite a good price. 45 euro. Or, yeah, 45 euro. And you get you get the Street Bot Willy, for example, in the Atlantic one. Yeah. And you get two other characters. Now yeah. I can remember spending about twenty pounds or something alone Aye. on Street Bot Willy. Yeah, yeah. Although I think that was back whenever it was the original company. I think it's a new company's running with these now. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. looking at some of the characters, they really just jump out at you. So you've got Colonel K Kelgore, is it? Captain Canada, Newark, and a few others. <laughs> and one of the, the one of the big things. One of the big things about this that really yeah. um, stuck with me was that effectively it reminds me a little bit of what Games Workshop were trying to achieve with something like uh, Inquisitor, yeah. mm -hmm. where you had that, that small-scale skirmish game where you maybe only had about three to five models, but the whole thing was based around the narrative and pushing that and a story. It was effectively a little bit like a role-playing yeah. game. And this almost has that same feel to it, where it's got that 
it's got that characterful like level to it where you, you you'll get to know your three or four guys that you use a lot and stuff like that mm. and you'll be able to plan very story driven missions and stuff around it so yeah I think it sounds really good fun this one for me yeah. it's got that blend so scroll back up a, a little bit there Justin yeah like the Reich stuff for example I'm looking at and again I think I've said this in the past about some other stuff but I'm looking at that and I'm getting the whole Hellboy feeling off it yeah yeah and definitely. I'm and I'm looking at and and especially like the 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 helmet robot thing. Yeah, th this is that's the just cool. Panzer Junker U boat. That's just <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, like I love the look of the Soviets as well because like, you see the the red commissar has a very very sort of Russian Orthodox feel to him with the the two big sensor maces on him. Yeah, it just feels like a miniature that you can imagine running around the the battlefield, lamping people with this weapon. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> one of the one of the things that stuck oh, out for me robot. when looking at the uh, the Reich stuff was that fact that while normal companies would go out there and do dog soldiers as werewolves, they've gone and actually made these guys into actual dogs, which I thought was very very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, they're like bulldogs and pit bulls yeah, yeah. and stuff like Rock that. Rockwellers, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rather than the the, the standard Reich, werewolf you get, yeah. the Reich has that really nice mad scientist feel to it that you really really want from a game yeah, like hence, this. Hence the Hellboy feeling for me. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But if we scroll back down, we were just Keep on going on yep. down. We're going towards the Soviet type faction. Yep. Now we're on the we're on the robot. It looks a bit like. Have you ever seen Black Hole? No. Ben, have you ever seen Black Hole, the Disney movie? No. no. He looks that robot. For who anybody who has seen it, this robot reminds me of Maximilian. There's a flying robot in it, and he's okay. red, and he has these blades that okay. spin right. around, and he's like, and he comes towards people, and he's right. with two blades, and he wants to kill people. Now, you, you've played Portal, haven't you? This robot reminds me of one of the little portal turrets that has just been, you know, done up to the nine. <laughs> yeah. What Hello? I like. Are you still there? What I like about it though is he doesn't just magically fly; he actually has rotors. I, yeah. I, you also have that really nice little smoke pillar sculpted onto this that makes you see him. You know what? You know it's. It's not exactly a very clean piece of technology. This is a rough piece of Soviet iron that they've managed to get to fly and shoot, you know, which is what you expect from the Soviet tech of the era. Yeah. He's definitely got a very... Uh, one of the things that I think struck with me a lot is that some of these models have a nice Fallout feel to them. And mm -hmm. I think Fallout had a very nice aesthetic. And I think that, uh, to carry over that kind of look to some of these models and give it that almost World War I, but also... You know, futuristic style to it as well is very, very cool. I think it's very key to the diesel punk aspect of this, where it's sort of bridging that gap between steampunk and almost the weird world war. So it's that mm -hmm. bit in between. Yeah. Now, very... this, um, this, this has been revived. Don't go past that. I want to talk about that in a second. Uh -huh. This has been revived. It used to be uh, by a company called Smartmax. Yes. Was it then? Yes. Yeah. Now there is a new company in charge of the range. What's happened? Have they basically bought it over, or what's, or revamped themselves, or do we know? Yeah. So Wonderland Projects are now in complete control of this now. They have all the old sculpts and stuff like that, and they've been bringing them out and selling them uh, bit by bit and stuff on their web store and things. They also do their own stuff as well, but uh, they're going to be carrying the, the range forward as well. Um, for example, when you look at things like the Pacific Empire, they've been working on sketches and, and sort of working progress stuff for those guys. So it seems like these guys are in it for the, the long haul when it comes to making this miniature game something, yeah. you know, to get stuck into. Because I like that as well. <clears throat> they haven't just taken the old game and taken it to Kickstarter. Mm. And says, here, buy the old stuff. Aye. Which looks amazing. I love it. Yep. But I like to see them. They are working on this Pacific Empire as well and say, well, mm. we're not just going to revamp an old game and push it out there. We're going to revamp the game and now start to add to it again. Yeah. Now, here's a question for you, Lloyd. The Pacific Empire, I would expect them to be the faction that you're going to go for because you always do like your, your sort of oriental samurai flavoured armies. Is this the one that's going to be Picking your fancy on this one? No. No? Absolutely really? not, because it's the robots <coughs> that I like. Ah, right. Scroll back up and we'll okay. have a look at them again, because I love the old different colours and stuff that they've painted them. Yeah. Right? So we have Street Bot Willie. That's the one I have. You see, there he is, right? Yep. Twenty nine fifty on his own. Aye. Whereas if you get him in the starter set, you get him and a couple of other miniatures. Yeah. That's far more palatable. Yeah. But I can't resist looking at the other ones going, someday I will pick these up. So what, uh, you want to grab Chuck? I want Chuck. Harpo and Buster. Because I think they would just be an awesome four characters to just throw into a game on their own. I, if they can all play as one faction, yeah. that would be amazing. And you know me, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna rip them even out of that world and just throw them into some other. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. I'll throw them into my dust games, even though they're World War One esque. I'm looking. I'm going. Why the heck not? Well, they for, look for cool. Me, I I would wish that there were three of them because that way I could do them as the three stooges. If you have a look, so you know, Larry, Curly, and Mo. 
and just actually have them as a little comedy trio that runs out on your table, which is well, very yeah. funny. I guess you could go with Chuck, Buster and Harpo in that sense, because they, uh, they have a sort of a blend. For some reason, Streetbot Willie's the odd one out. I, I, you see, I think he might be an older design, perhaps. Yes, Willie came first, mm. and then the rest aye. followed. Aye, aye. Well, I mean, like, it, it's beautiful stuff. I'm really loving the look for it. I think if I had to pick, I'm really torn between the Reich and the, the Theo Soviets. I think the C Theo Soviets have it just by an edge because they just look really, really badass. You know, so that, that's, that's where I'm at. Normally, you don't get into the whole Soviet thing, at least I don't think. No, nor Which normally. Which surprises me because I, I thought you'd love the big hats and everything. But I do like my pointy hat. <laughs> I do like my pointy hat. <laughs> Looking at that, that Panzer Junker U boat. It's it's really tempting me, but I want I want about thirty of them. I think they would just be class as a as a as an army of tentacled. Do you know what they they remind me of the stuff from the Matrix aye, as well. Yeah, aye, the, the and I just think it'd be really creepy wandering around an old city type thing and they're popping out of corners and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, even then, you can see sort of an influence from War of the Worlds in these, where where they have those big long spindly legs. You remember the original one? It kind of reminds me on that just for its some of its design aesthetics. You know. It's really cool. I'm really tempted by this. Yeah, it has that look about it, along with another game. Oh crap! I cannot remember the name of it. Describe it. There's a World War One game. Oh, uh, uh, something Martians. Aye, all quiet on the Martian front. That's the one. Ta da! It has the, that tentacle-esque look to it as well. Yeah. That's the same sort of thing. Mm. But if we scroll down, what are there any stretch goals and stuff that uh, are really Champions interesting? Champions funded. They're doing some resin bases, which is yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a nice enough. little bit of extra flavor. Uh, and then we're into the locked stuff, I think. So we've got Michal. Uh, it looks like they're just really going to be looking to add oh, some oh, new characters. Oh, Shield bought Danny. Shield bought Danny, aye. Oh, Danny boy. Uh, a kamikaze. It's all blacked out at the minute, so I am interested to keep an eye on this and actually see where this Kickstarter goes. You know, I think yeah. it's, it's yeah. going to be a really cool one. And once we get it down on the tabletop, even building tables and stuff for this. Yeah. Doing sort of a, a ruined France, a ruined par Parisian, you know. If you do, oh, what's the what's the shopping place in Paris? TK Maxx. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, there, there's a particular particular street, the canals or something. I can't remember the name of it, but there's there's one little street I would love to do because I, I remember seeing pictures of it when I was younger, and I think doing it all bombed out and destroyed would be fantastic, you know, for playing a game like this on. Roma, comment below. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> Roma. It's the touristy shopping area. You know the one I'm on about. Is it the one you took me to? Who knows? No, because if you were visiting Roman Paris, he's not taking you anywhere near the touristy places. He's taking you to the local places, which are really, really expensive. He took me to a fancy place that was like all shopping -y, but it wasn't like new shops. It was like really old. Ah, the Champs-Élysées. Oh, the Champs-Élysées. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been there. Roman didn't take me there, no. Yeah. He took so. me to some more arty parts of the, of the city. Yeah, Romans want to do that whenever you're out and about, man. <laughs> let's go back up. Let's see where we are on funding and stuff. Uh, okay, uh, let ben, me call you up here, Ben. Just big, just so I can scroll quickly and ben, not make people feel ill. Ben, you look amazing, but we're going to get rid of you in a sec because I want to see what oh. the funding level is at the time of filming. And uh, The funding level at time of filming is... Da, 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 5,999. So of halfway there with 25 days to go. Yeah, I, you know what, Lloyd? I'll tell you what. You like one of the factions, I like one of the factions. What do you say? Do you want to jump in? I'm going to back this Kickstarter because I want more. Unfortunately, though, the faction I want already has a willy in it. Yeah, but you can have two willies. But I've got a willy. I don't need any more willies. Come on, everybody needs more willies. If I could swap it out for one of the other things, maybe they'll have like a Kickstarter manager or something. Uh, possibly, <laughs> possibly. But here, I'll tell you what. If we're doing it, let's jump in because I see a pledge here that actually lets you get two starter sets if I call it up here. You've got their thank yeah. you pledge, they're starting the war. And then they're a war contributor. So this gets you two of the starter sets to get kicked off, as well as a PDF map. So I think that's the one I would like to go for. Yeah. What I would you say? I think, I think I'm in for this. I think they need to work on that, because I don't see the benefit in the both of us buying in. Uh, you see, it means that we're, we're then... If we're getting a PDF. Aye, but we're then at a higher pledge level. So, I mean, like there are some people who'll jump in for the single starter set on the lower pledge level, and that might not actually activate stretch goals at that pledge level. But if you and me buddy up, we can jump in at a higher pledge level, which is a greater chance of actually gaining stretch goals once they start to hit them. So okay. It's the same as what myself and John did for uh, oh, Drop Fleet Commander. Drop Fleet. Yeah. We, we jumped in at a higher pledge level together, and by doing that, we got an absolute ton of extra stuff because we were at the, the high rank backer level. You know, so yeah. doing, doing it that way, you have more chance of getting 
more of the add-ons and stuff. So Let's take a quick look out. then at the packages and, and, and see which package we like the look of. All right, now for me at the minute, I'm thinking War Contributor because that gets us our two nice starter sets. Right, so let's, let's go down and look at, look at the starter sets. Yeah. Ben, do you want in on this, do you? Oh, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> potentially. All right. <laughs> it's tempting, the Shiny Syndrome let's is go. great. Yeah, so scrolling down. Right, you see, this is the one I would have probably went for. Yeah. Except I already have my Street Bot Willy. Mm -hmm. So I'd end up with two of them. But I guess if you know if you want to throw them into war games and stuff like that, having two yeah, badass robots is not a bad thing. Don't forget, once we actually start playing the game, we will eventually expand our forces. So yeah. there might come a time where you would want two of the street bot willies on the table. Yeah. You know, so it might be worth it. But it would be cool to have one of the other robots. Yeah. Well, for myself, I'm I'm not going to go with the Reich. I'm going to go with the Th Theo Soviets because yeah. I think they just look absolutely amazing as a starter set. Ben, which one would you go for? I, uh, I think if you had to push, if you were pushed into it, if I was, uh, if I was pushed, I, I would love to go with the Theo Soviets, but I know that just it's quite, quite tempted by those. So I think I'd have to do the Panzer. I can go down the sort of Hellboy route and paint them up in some crazy, crazy fashion, like mm. comic book style or something. That'd be awesome. Cool, yeah. cool. Well, there you have it. I think, I think before we even look at our next Kickstarter, we have our winner for this week. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not be too presumptuous. Aye. Uh, I do have my project sorted out. No yeah. more of this moping around the studio going, oh, I want to paint something, but I don't know what. Mm, back of the net. Yeah. I'm definitely painting that. <laughs> oh, look, uh, you know what I'm like at the minute. I'm just nose to the grindstone, working away on projects at home, which will eventually make their way in here to be shown off. Yeah. yeah but for doing that, that will generally be on the backstage show on Sundays. Yeah. I do want to keep that for our backstagers. If I do start painting it, I'm probably going to do the same thing as I did with my dust thing and try and keep a wee log of it and throw right. it into the hobby forums and stuff so yeah, yeah. everyone can enjoy what I'm doing with, with my willy. Aye. Aye. And I can share the love. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Moving on. Yes. We have another Kickstarter for you. Ben, what's yeah, up? Yeah, so this is a game called the, uh, Near and Far. It's a storytelling board game. This is by Red Raven Games. Now, these guys have come out with a, a, a board game called Above and Below and this is effectively a sequel to this. Yeah. And the whole idea behind this one is that you're going out there as a bunch of adventurers two to four players, and you're going to be searching for a lost ruin out there in the sands by going through this storybook narrative. And it's very, very cool, this. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, like, we're, we're having a look at the main game layout here, and what I'm seeing at the very top is you've got your rule book, but then you've got this atlas book. Now, yeah. this is the key for this game for me. That idea that this doesn't just come with a board that you're going to fold out. It comes with a book that as you open each page, that becomes your new map to play across. So it's very, very cool, very thematic. I love the idea of that. Yeah, so if we look here, we can see the front of the book and then further down the actual folded out yeah. with the ring binder in the middle. So yeah. what you're saying, Justin, is there's pages and pages to explore here. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, like as, as far as I understand it, there is, there is a linked campaign system that you can play through in this with each person playing an adventure and your eventual goal is to find, you know, the final temple. So I think once you find the final temple, you get your, your heart's desire, you know, so it's... It's that holy grail quest yeah. you're sort of getting with this, that kind of a story, which I think is going to be a lot of fun for people to play on the tabletop with their friends and family. Now, Ben, you say this is like a, a sequel. You want to tell us what the first one was, what the, the objective was? Yeah, so with the first one, you were playing, it was a game called Above and Below, and it by the same designer. And the, the idea in that is that you were trying to bring together a settlement. And one of the ideas behind it was it was effectively a little bit like a worker placement and a role selection type of game where you sent people off to gather resources and create a little town effectively that um, had the riches and stuff from the local area. Yeah. Mm. But one of the aspects of it that has been carried over into the sequel was there was also this storybook and narrative aspect of things as well. And what would happen that with that is that when you delved down into the deeps, what someone else at the table would read a passage from a book and this would be a little bit like a choose your own adventure style thing. It was like, do you do option A or do, or do you do option B? And this was like a small part of Above and Below because it was more of like a resource type game with this one where you were looking after your people and making sure they could survive and trade and things like that. In this one, when you're looking at near and far, that's the real meat of this. That story-driven campaign narrative that's dragging you from page to page, from Atlas page to actual page, and down into the ground and above it and stuff like that, to all these different quirky places. So yeah, it's got some really good stuff in this that really makes you sort of think about a cool story at, uh, sort of aspect to things. Mm. And it's great to see your. It was great to see in above and below how your little community sort of prospered and grew and whether or not your reputation would go down with the people below and stuff and with this they've done the same kind of thing but with a character where you'll gain experience and you'll gain items as you travel and stuff that go into your backpack and 
Right. Yeah, this so just that, sounds really good. Let me just yeah. stop you there. So in the first game, yeah. you were looking after a settlement. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So you're looking after lots of people. Yes, you are, yeah. Whereas in this game, you are already playing an individual character on a quest. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, in this you'll be Justin, playing as... Justin's mentioned like a, a, a ruin or something that, we're, that you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, for a linked campaign system. So the very end of that linked campaign system is finding the final ruin. Why are they looking for this ruin? Because that once you actually find that final ruin, you're, you're granted your, your heart's desire. So whether it's to be to bring back a lost love, to reunite with your family... You know, wealth, riches, and fame, things like that. You know. Yeah, but I'm just trying to get what. Well, how do they know that? I, all, all the, I'm getting the grasp of the first game is to have a, a successful settlement. Mm. I'm trying to get to the bottom of what is their motivation to go and find this ruin, and how do they know about it? We well, see that that's the interesting part about it because each character has their own individualized backstory, their own motivation. So every time you play through, I mean, you could play through the entire thing and then play through a game as again as a different character you'll get an entirely different experience because of those linked story aspects that pop up once in a while, but also the motivations behind your character that are built in will maybe make you take different choices, different directions yeah, as you play through. Yeah, but what I mean is, right? It's in the story. In the first game, the I've story. got my settlements, Yes. right? What happens that makes people want to start leaving the settlement and going looking for things? Ben. It's the it's the basis of the human adventure thing, isn't it? So it's like you've built this settlement; it is now you know prospering and things like that. But there are everybody who wants to go out there and do an adventure and find something new. And the whole idea behind this is it's meant to engage that sense of exploration that humans have. And in this fantasy world, that's what these people have as well. And so every different page, there are eleven different sort of uh, atlas pages, effectively, or atlas you know spreads that you go through and each of these different ones will tell you different stories and have different moments and different character interactions and things like that and so it's all about moving through those 11 different atlas atlases and getting to the very final page where you'll find the ruins and getting there and trying to solve the puzzles and all sorts of different things so it's all human qu um, qu quizity, qu yes. curiosity yeah. yes. human curiosity there's yeah. no body turned up and started no, passing no, through no. the village and they had to go on a quest to mm. kill yeah. the body or to yeah. find the ability to kill the body or anything like that. Oh, there, there they just got bored. Like they just no. got bored sitting in their village and said, I'm going to go for a wander a la Hobbit style. Well, you see, <laughs> it, it's, it's the thing I like about this. With the way they've done the game surface in this, you have a very expansive world, but it's still very self-contained. So you can go on a massive adventure, a big, epic story, as if you were doing you know, the whole Hobbit thing of, you know, going out from your village, not knowing what you're up to, learning to live, learning to fight, and actually becoming an adventurer. I love that idea, and I love that it's so self-contained within this really cool idea of having it on a map book. Let's go back to the map book. Yeah. So. And, and see this book, because the interesting thing, I wish they had a bigger picture of it, mm. is I do like the, the, the way they've illustrated the above and below in the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it like that in the, the original? Like, is the board game, is it board yeah. game based and there's like a, a board that looks a bit like that or something, Ben? Yeah, in the, in the original, what happens is you normally just build your settlement on the world above. Yeah. But as you go and explore the land below, you uh, unlock the ability to sort of build structures down below in the places where the, the people from the underground start to trust you. So it's all about sort of expo exploring both the, the nice, happy, sunny world above and the slightly darker world below. And this is the same kind of thing in this where you can take the sort of more treacherous path potentially underground into the, the darkness to try and fight off bandit, well, living statues and strange things, or you can travel the dusty roads of the, the surface world and meet all the characters up there. So dusty wherever you roads, go, there'll be something this? different. That's amazing. Oh. Dusty Rhodes the wrestler. <laughs> he just said travel with Dusty oh. Rhodes. No. Well, if you want to name your character <laughs> Dusty Rhodes, you can do. <laughs> all right, so what you're telling me is, even in the first one, I had nosy neighbours. Yes, yes, you did, yeah. Who just went to say, I'm bored, I'm going to go and have we nosy and be all inquisitive. Well, yes. I, mean, like, I, I, I always like the idea of having, you know, that, that society creation and expansion type of game. I mean, like, have you played Sid Meier Civilization or anything like that, Lloyd? Any, any of those type of games? What do you mean? Like the PC game? Yeah. Civilization? Yeah. I've played bits at it. I mean, like, it, this sounds as if it has that same sort of flavour and feel where it's, you know, I'm growing my society to make it the biggest well, well, and best this, in the world. Not this game. No, no, the, the, original the original one. The original one sounds like that. This is just the game of, oh, I got bored one day. And this I sounds like Fable on the tabletop. Yeah, exactly. It's more than I got bored one day. It's, it's the I human got bored one nature. day and buggered <laughs> off to, find, to, call a spade a spade. to find fame and adventure. Yeah, I hear, I hear. Oh wait, I forgot. You don't watch anime. Trust me. I'm not there, there, are, that. there are a lot of anime that just begin that way. One day I shall adventure. <laughs> just wanted to get to the motivation. <laughs> yeah. Of the characters. Anyway, each I character think, is their own story. I think that wraps it up. All right. I think we know about them. Okay. 
do we even bother to say who's back and what if they wanted? Miser Earth, all the way. Miser Earth for me too. Ben? I would have to, as much as I like the models of Mouser Earth, I'd have to go with Near and Far because I really, really loved Above and Below and I think this would be a fantastic new board game experience mm. to do this one as well. So yeah, Near and Far for me. Well, there you go. Comment below. Do you agree with me and Justin? Is Mouser Earth the way to go? Do you agree <laughs> with Ben? Exploring down underneath the ground Ooh. is better <laughs> than having World War One-esque weird fights. <laughs> it depends on what you're Will after. you find dusty roads on your trip underground? <laughs> I'm Who knows? Lloyd engaged a narrator voice from nowhere. I'm, I'm enjoying my narrator, narrator voice. I'm yeah. going to have to work on that. <laughs> anyway, that wraps it up. That wraps up the show. Oh, bar one little bit of information. I want to highlight that the Wargaming Survey 2016 is now live. And there is, there is a link. Mm -hmm. in, in, on the, there is a post actually on the website. But we'll also put a link into the story notes of this show. Go ahead, pop on over. I don't know if you have to register and stuff, but if you do register up, get your results in there because I want to see, I want to see what people think, and I want to see if it changes drastically from you this year. You want to knock year. off the top, top slot from last year. What? You want to knock off the top slot from last year. The sci-fi stuff. Was it sci-fi? Yeah. Well, last was year sci was sci-fi. Yeah. The year before that was World War II. Yeah. 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 Let's well, see if we can get pull pump hot pull pump pump pull <laughs> punk <laughs> horror and weird <laughs> to the top. Yes. Let's get miles of Earth and weird stuff up there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, that wraps up the show. If you've enjoyed it, we do an extra show on the Sunday. It's, uh, it's early in the morning, so you can lie in bed with your iPad and a cup of tea, enjoying us. We're doing this again tomorrow, guys. Yeah, it's exactly. as simple as that. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk a lot more about even more cool gaming stuff, more ideas that we've been playing around with, with while we've been gaming, and actually some of the games that we've been playing. And myself and Lloyd have actually found an epic game that we're really enjoying at the minute. So... Tune in tomorrow morning, bright and early, Sunday morning on BeastsofWar.com to join us for the Weekender Extra Long Backstage. <laughs> <laughs> extra Long Backstage. Yes. Right, it is, it is in the Backstage segment, but there is a seven-day free trial, and we will put the link in the notes. Until next time, have a great week's gaming, everyone. Anime cyberpunk style meets skirmish combat in Infinity. Experience eight high-tech factions and fight to control the human sphere at the Infinity Hub on BeastsOfWar.com. Flames of War brings you the battles of World War II in epic 15mm scale. Go to the Hub on BeastsOfWar.com to find news, tactics and tutorials about the game.